Tēnei, ka haramai nei takatū mai ui ui i wāwā tatu wana wite whakaro kota hi ko tēnei te mei ko tēnei te kupu mai wa tēnā koutou. Ko wai tēnei tū wana, ko maunga hiku rangi e mihu atu nei, ko State Highway 35 te papakainga, ko Ken Taia Patoku Ingoa. Kia ora everyone and welcome back to those of you here a tinana in person and those of us in the hubs and on the Zoom. It's uh, wonderful f uh, to come back together and to carry on with the Papa for the day. So, um, I've, obviously, I'm, your M I'm the MC this afternoon, and I promise you I will keep it interesting, and I will do my best to keep us to time. Um, now, however, I do acknowledge that this is the afternoon slot. It's the graveyard shift, and everyone's feeling sluggish um, from lunch. So, if you would, and at home, um, for those of you at the hubs and on Zoom, um, staying where you are seated, copy after me very quickly. Because if we can, if our Modi is in a state of flux, we can also do things to lift our Modi. So let's do that now. So copying after me. Ah. Ah, eh, ah. Ah, eh, e, eh, ah. A e i o i e a. Okay, here we go. A e I don't know. I'll lead. A e i o u o i e a. Kapai, no, well done. <laughs> well done. <laughs> but just to grab that fakaro, that if our modi needs to be replenished, we can do these little micro breaks. We can uh, have a bit of a kata kata, have a laugh, and carry on. Um, no data. Speaking of carrying on, so we're now moving on to the the next theme of our conference, and this is around, funnily enough, restoring modi. The idea that when a modi wanes, we can pick it up. And I just want to acknowledge that um, we've, we've used the concept of Modi as, as, as a framework on how we can lay this over the health system and how we can think about how um, that relationship between our environments and us and our health. So this theme really is about our physical environment and how restoration of our natural and social landscapes will restore and enhance the Modi of those participating in them, because from our Māori understanding, our view of the world, we can't separate ourselves from our environments. You know, we are intrinsically connected to our environments, and um, that's the place that we're coming from today. So, um, to get the ball moving, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Johnny Freeland. So, Johnny um, of Ngāti Te Atawaiohua and Ngai Tuhoi is a wayfinder, a systems navigator and whakapapa-centred designer. He brings together more than 30 years' knowledge and lived experience of serving community and in guiding and navigating a range of iwi, Māori community and public sector organisations and working to achieve better outcomes with Māori, with being the operative word. Uh, he utilises mātauranga Māori, Māori knowledge systems, thinking, knowledge and practice in navigating systems. He draws on specific knowledge and practice of maramataka, lunar celestial cycles and whakatere waka, uh, waka navigation in designing oranga motuhake, well-being pathways, um, with whānau, hapu, iwi and organisations, again, with being the operative word. Johnny has helped navigate a whakapapa centred response to climate change with Tama, Tamaki Makoto um, through the Tamaki Makoto Mana Whenua Forum and partnering with the Auckland, Count, Auckland Council. Together, they work to harness the benefits of drawing on mātauranga Māori knowledge and Western science to navigate a way forward for Tamaki Makoto Auckland through the co-development of the Tauruki Atawhiri Auckland's climate plan. Uh, he has also worked with Te Waiohua Iwi of uh, Akitai, Ngāti Tamaho, Tamaoho, 
and Ngāti Te Ata in leading and underpinning the Whakaoranga o Te Puhinui, Puhinui Re Regeneration Programme alongside Auckland Council, Manu Dewa and Ōtara Papa Toitoi local boards, Eke Panuku and Kainga Ora, focused on regenerating the ecological, social, cultural and economic well-being of the Puhinui stream and its communities. Nō reira, a i rungi tēnā um, e te tōkana, Johnny Nō Mai Haramai. Uh, tēnā tātou katoa e mihi kawana ki, uh, ki te hui nei, uh, e mihi kawana ki nga uh, kāhui maunga, uh, nga wai tūpuna ki te iwi kāinga, uh, nga ti toa tarana ki whānui, uh, e mihi kawana kia, uh, kia koutou, kia tātou. Uh, e mihi hoki uh, ki nga uh, kāinga o te mutu, uh, I, I roto i te, te rorohiku a zoo, nō reira uh, tēnā tātou. Um, kia ora everybody, I've, I've just put a timer on because um, I'm having to really cape to uh, um, chronological time and uh, western time. A and um, I operate in a different time and I have an open relationship with time. <laughs> um, so I just have to uh, conform to this space. Um, and... Um, but just really want to acknowledge um, uh, Toa and his welcome and his opening of our, our session and acknowledging our haukainga um, and also acknowledging our, our previous speakers and, and those speakers to come. Uh, one of the questions that was asked is why are we here? Um, we, when I had the opportunity and was invited to come in Kōrero, I'm not really here for that. Uh, when I saw the list of other speakers, I'm here to really be fed and nourished. Um, and, um, and I'm a bit of a mātaranga Māori groupie. Um, and just love listening to the whakaro and, and others, and all the speakers. Um, and, and Ihi and his kōrero sort of talked about um, mātaranga. And, and I guess, you know, you mentioned moihotanga. And, and the most important aspect is maramatanga. Uh, which is our term for wisdom. Um, knowing stuff is just knowing stuff. That's just knowledge. Um, but when we bring it together with our inner knowing and our inherited knowing from our ancestors, which sits in our puku, um, and through applied learning, applied experiences, you know, when we bring it to action, it's through the lived experience that maramatanga or wisdom manifests. And, and I think that's the sweet spot we were trying to navigate towards. Um, so I really want to acknowledge. Um, and I just really want to acknowledge Sama and her kōrero. Um, that picture of her great-great-grandmother and grandmother um, in the Waipā River, I, I whaka papa from that awa. And, and so my memories my, went back to that time. Um, I live in a four-generational home. My mum's 83 this year. My wife and I, our baby who's 15, our youngest daughter and her husband, and they're in their mid-30s, and two of our grandchildren. And so seeing that image that um, Summer shared, I ju it just made me realise that next year in 2024, our granddaughter, who was born in um, October last year, she represents nine generations of refugee whakapapa that we were displaced when our home village of Rangiafia was burnt down by the British forces and we got dispersed to Tamaki Makaurau. And so next year represents 160 years of displacement, disconnection. And it's only been in the last four generations that we're looking to heal. Um, and in the healing is this sort of stuff and how we heal together. Um, and I guess the challenge and opportunity when we start to look to indigenous knowledge, um, the opportunity and challenge really is, and, and our speakers have really talked about it, it's about healing. 
and the challenge and opportunity. And I think given our, our current state of the world and all the flux that's happening, um, we're coming to a point of a decision on where's our next point of navigation. In a similar way that our entities got on a waka from Hawaii a thousand years ago to come to this place. So what drove them? Why? And the other thing is not everyone got on the waka. And, and many of us in our own whanau whakapapa are those similar journeys. Whether it was our parents that got on the boat from Scotland to come here. Um, you know, something caused the shift and a, and a movement. So we're in that sort of point. And, and if you like, it's like we're all sitting at the beach envisioning this next journey for ourselves. And, and it's something that someone uh, mentioned. And, you know, the theme around COVID was he waka e no, we all in this together. But how we? That's the real beautiful, lovely whakaro, but where's the action and, you know, so, so, um, so the opportunity and the challenge is that how can Māori, how can Indigenous people, because I think we were trying to find a return home, back to source, because at one point, all our whakapapa was Indigenous. So when we talk about re-Indigenising, it's about a return to source. And the role that Māori can play in this context of Aotearoa is not only karanga you home, but help navigate you home in the way we heal ourselves and we help heal the mokopuna of the colonizer. That's the opportunity. So when we talk about planetary health and human health, it's really about anchoring around oranga well-being. And so I found the, the, the panel kōrero around the biomedical whakapapa tradition, this focus is on ill-being. So we've got a whole industry based on ill-being that talks about well-being. You know, we're not really navigating it in that way. So, um, so that's just a bit of a preclude and just the acknowledgement of all of us and our speakers. Um, I just love the way that, um, um, that our, um, that Toa talked about um, the, the sort of matariki. Um, I know just the other night, Hokainga here, uh, Nga uh, Te Atiawa, um, did an observation for Puanga, uh, which is their star on the west coast that we look to, as opposed to Matariki, which is east coast. Um, but in that, talking about Tafiri, um, Mata Araki, the eyes of Tafiri Matia. So within Tamaki Makare, our 19 manafino there worked together with Auckland Council. And we really anchored in a, in a mātauranga Māori way of being. And again, um, for us, Tāwhiri is our primal ancestor for climate. And Te Tāruki a literally refers to the struggles of Tāwhiri Mātia and what we're experiencing in terms of recent cyclones, COVID, all that sort of stuff. Um, so it's all connected. Um, so I just want to kick off the presentation with a little video to kick off. That's right. Um. <laughs> O te ngāhere, o te moana, o te hau, o te uenuku, o te puia, o te rūwhenua, o te aruhi, o te kūmara, o te wai māori, o te tangata. Ti hei mauri ora. E aku ira tangata. He tupu koe no te whenua o te whaia. He puna koe no ngā wai o o tūku. He māngai koe mō o manātua. Engari, nā tēnei au hau, kua mimiti haere tō tāua hono. Ka kite au i tōku oranga ki roto i a koe. Ka kite hoki koe i tō oranga ki roto i a hau. A, kua he katoa tāua, kua he katoa tātai. Kua tai te wā mā tāua anō tāua e whakaora. Kau, ko koe, 
Kotarma. Um, that that um, video was put together by uh, a team of Rangatahi and Tamaki Makaro in their reflection of our Whakapapa systems and the impact of Western systems on that Whakapapa. So that's our reflection of Te Taruki Atafri. But in this time, it, it creates an opportunity around um, how we reimagine, reframe and reset, because we all talk about transforming systems and how we reorient, recyclize and regenerate. Um, our queer, our, our um, fire wahine and tamaki, um, they use the term recirculisation, uh, not just reindigenization or decolonization, because it's about the return to circle systems. And all of humanity need to recirculise. Um, the problem, and we've coined this term called squareisation, it's about the impact of square systems. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we're working to heal and regenerate the state of oranga or well-being of people, place, and nature. Tangata, taiao, and whenua. Um, from the long-reaching impacts of colonisation, westernisation, and urbanisation. And the opportunity to return to source our ukaipo, like Mother Earth, she who sustains us or feeds us or mum. Uh, mai nā pito o nā tāone nui ki te rauru o papa tūnuku. So, um, in, in Māori thinking, uh, for the umbilical cord, we have three interconnected terms. So the pito is the part that stays with baby. The rauru is the part that's attached through mum, through the placenta or whenua. And the iho is the element that connects both. So really what we're regenerating is re-attaching our umbilical cords back to Mother Earth, in short. Um, and then acknowledging that the impact of square system. So we've got our little circle system that's been entrapped in the square. And the thing about um, square systems, you're forced either into a corner or you've got to take sides. Whereas the solution focuses around that recirculisation through mātaranga Māori uh, wisdom and practice systems. Um, and, and in that context, we, we tend to be more pracademics than academics. Uh, it's about the applied practice and, and, and in the doing is the knowing, uh, not just the thinking. Um, and certainly within the Aotearoa context, this particular system of knowledge, which is ecologically anchored, um, has evolved over the last thousand years. Or if you listen to my whanaunga, my iwi and tūhoi, they talk about 2,000 years. Um, but that's on the back of 50,000 years of knowledge across the Pacific. You know, it's Western systems that have divided us and give us, give us, given us names like Polynesians and Macronesians, whereas we're all whakapapa whānau. We're all interconnected. And when you think about how we draw from the wisdom of nature, we're thinking about millions of years of knowing that's in the geology, the hydrology, you know, and it's, it's tapping into those things as well. So what we're observing is a bit of a shift and convergence. Two shifts and a convergence, which is really exciting. And this kōrero is really about um, that convergence, if you like. So within that current Western square thinking, it's linear, it's extractive in nature, patriarchal, individual rights and interests. Um, but what we're seeing is a shift to secular thinking in the Western context. And that's really exciting. So even MB are talking about how do we start to prepare for New Zealand to shift to a circular economy, for example. A lot of our kōrero, especially around human health, planetary health, that's causing a shift in circular thinking. Um, and that's regenerating about the partnership between um, humanity and nature. And, and the term they use in the UK is the commons. Um, and then at the same time what's happening is we're seeing this other shift away from the impacts of colonisation or squareisation, and which is you know, a lot of rights and interests, treaty rights, legal rights, human rights. Um, the rights of nature has recently come in the last few years. Uh, indigenous rights. So, um, so when you think about Crown Māori relationships, it's primarily focused on 
how does the Crown recognise the right, rights of Māori? Whereas in a, a more secular, and, and in this context, I, I use the term spiral systems, which are transgenerational, interconnected, and so it's more of a, a, a spiral. We use the double kuru pattern of a takarangi. And, and it's intergenerational, whakapapa-centred, and it's anchored on our shared obligations and responsibilities, not about our rights and interests. That's a square whakaro that's been imported into this place. So, um, and, you know, crisis is a term that's bandied around a lot at the moment. So we seem to be always in crisis. I'd suggest in the last um, almost 200 years, Māori have been in a state of crisis because of the process of squareisation. So whether it's whānau in crisis, COVID, climate change, um, recovery from natural disasters like um, Cyclone Gabriel and now Auckland anniversary flooding in Tamaki Makaurau, from a Māori perspective, it's all anchors in the same whakaaro around wellbeing. But we tend to div divide it off into all these. So we're going to have a plan for every, like a um, equity transition plan and an adaption plan and a health plan, where it all is unified by the pursuit of wellbeing. So how can we take the learnings, and, and certainly in the recent time of COVID, cycling Gabriel, um, to really start to rethink and reimagine. Um, and that's been a voice of Māori for um, very heightened in the last five years, but it's a, it's a common waiata in the last 150 years. Um, and I guess the issue around vulnerability, adaption and resilience are not new concepts for Māori. We're still here. You know, so what can we learn from that as opposed to always locating our people, oh, we need to build Māori resilience. If we weren't resilient in our whakapapa, we wouldn't be here. <coughs> and not just in a human sense, we're thinking about wider whakapapa. Um, and, and certainly what some of the sharp things that happened within COVID is that our whānau hold memories that go back to 1918 and the influenza where there was no support for our people. Um, and Dr. Rawiri Taunu, who's a historian, sort of went back into history, and we are, like in Waikato, our villages were roadblocked because the fear was they were going to spread influenza, but there was no distinction of ethnicity in terms of who got it. Um, and, and there's all that evidence. And so our whānau still hold. Uh, one of my ancestors, uh, my great-great-great-grandmother and her daughter died within three days because of influenza in 1918. They lived in a papakaiinga unihunga in Auckland. We couldn't bring them home to our urupa, so they're buried in a Waikamiti century, uh, cemetery. So my challenge now is I've got to pick them up and bring them home over 100 years later. Um, the other key thing, and when we start to look at, and these are two photos from Wairua, is that crisis also exposes inequity. And, and the other most amazing thing is the success of what a Māori-led response to our being. Not just for Māori, but for all people. So we've seen like in the coast where Marae become refuge, refuge centres for all community, not just Māori. The Fano order response in Auckland for all people around the care and support. And what there's been a heightened advocacy for is why can't we have a Māori led response to climate, to health? Because how, how many times do we have to prove ourselves in, in a Māori systems way? Because we're in Aotearoa. Um, the other key element um, to our success, if you like, or the work we've been doing, is this emergence of what we call mātaranga harua, dual knowledge systems or frameworks. And what this creates is what I call a binocular view. And, and what we have currently is a system where we co-op Māori things, determined by someone else's decision making, or what's in or not, as opposed to how do you recognise the mana and integrity of dual systems and how we co and 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 like if we've all had a play of the binoculars, there's that little knob in the middle 
that you've got to sort of work out how to get your two lenses aligned so that you get that clarity of the view forward. And so we're in that sort of time. But in some ways, um, just to acknowledge these binoculars there, because the Western system is so dominant that, you know, so, um, so we have this little mantra, acknowledge the square so we can see the circle. And it's emerging through nature because of climate change, flooding, all that stuff. So nature will find its way back regardless of how we are. And so with Oranga at the centre, it's how we then regenerate um, the well-being of our whakapapa systems, taiao, wai, whenua and whanau. And it's sort of in that order. So it's a bit like what he spoke about, atua tu matua. You know, we, we've lost the sense of our connection to atua. And they're not gods, that's a square term. They're our primal ancestors. Because we, our whakapapa is not just human, it's the connection to people, place, and nature. So in terms of our, our whaioranga thinking, which is the whakapapa-centred pursuit of well-being, so employing mataranga Māori systems, there's sort of three elements of activation, if you like, anchored around that relationship between taiao, whenua, tangata. So tūhonanga, so how do we reconnect physically, um, spiritually, and psychologically and mentally to nature, place, and people. The whakauranga is the regenerating and restoring the mana, tapu, and maori, maori. So we've talked about, you know, restoring maori. Um, but there's an interrelationship, whakapapa relationship between maori, tapu, and mana. And, and um, they're sort of equated to um, the electrons, neutrons, um, and the space in between is what joins it all together. And, and that all sits within our whakapapa at a, at a cellular level or a stellar level. It, it's again acknowledging those whakapapa systems. But our biggest challenge is around this element of wānanga. And it's not just about how we gather in wānanga. Wānanga is about the relationship and practice of time. And ancient Greeks had two terms, chronos and kiros. Chronos being sequential time, kiros being moments of time. So in Te Reo Māori, we have Te Taima, which is tick, tick time. But it seems it's always running out. Um, one of the big, and it's been one of the biggest things that's colonised this place, is bringing that Gregorian time into this place. Because we're all caught up in the hamster wheel of time. We're running out, we're chasing time. There's, whereas the other Māori term is Te Wā. And Te Wā, te wā is a space where past, present, and future converges. It's a sort of time-space continuum. And we can evoke the state of wā by evoking modi, where, you know, the way we connect and, and evoke space. And so, if we're going to think about transforming systems, we have to come to terms with time. And we saw a little glimpse of um, when we, humanity was in Arawi, we were in lockdown, and I think given the global impact of like lockdown, I think humanity may not have experienced that sort of lockdown since the Ice Age. And for that moment, especially in the first lockdown, we saw this regeneration of nature occur, because we weren't the noise interfering. But we were so hungry to get back to sort of normal time, um, but there was enough of a window and, and the opportunity around restoring hope. And so, the, the challenge about restoring time, or oh, that relationship to time, is so critical. Um, the other sort of um, system we look to, and I think this is all in our DNA, because we all have got a story of how either in my generation, or a couple of generations back, or further generations, that we all arrived here on some form of waka. A waka haurua sailing from Hawaii or a steamship um, that came, or a sailing ship in the 1800s, steamship in the early 19, or a waka rangi. But we all have these journeys that, and what amazes me is, why did our tupuna decide to leave home to come to another home? You know, we're at that sort of juncture of 
working out why do we need to, and not even everyone's convinced on the why. But when we start to think from a navigational, te pai whakatere means navigating horizons. And we often fall into what's the current state and what are the options for the future. But what we miss out on is drawing on the knowledge of our past and our past horizons. And how do we take that learning? And what Māori offers is just about a thousand years of learning and knowing in this location. You know, understanding where we are now, um, what does that vision or destination look like? Because we need to be clear on not only where we're going, but where are we landing? And how do we know when we've arrived? That's the critical part. And then from there, the journey and the different horizons. The, the Paitata, which is the horizon immediately before us. The Paitafati is that space beyond the horizon we can't sort of um, see, but it anchors us in, in that hopeful future. And then in terms of how that's manifested in action, th these are three examples that I've been involved in. Um, te Taruki Atafari, which is a Whakapapa Centre climate response. And, and while the information talks about mana whenua partnering with council, the bit underneath is it's 19 mana whenua having to partner with each other in order to partner with council. Um, and, and then, and I really encourage you to have a look at this because it's got the uh, dual knowledge framing within it. Uh, te Whakauranga o Te Pūnui is a 50 year project that kicked off in the last couple of years. And what started out as a stream restoration and a community development thing, mana uh, whenua have anchored it, and it's a whakaora, oranga thing. So it's a regeneration of the Māori tapu and mana of the people and the awa. Um, and more of a localised example, I was based at Wellington City Council last year, and the work we've done with mana whenua and Māori to develop two piki ora, which is the Māori strategy for Wellington. And so within there is embedded uh, mātauranga Māori thinking, so in terms of how we apply it, I encourage you to, to have a look. And in closing, um, just really want to acknowledge one other important thing from a whakapapa perspective, and it's around this issue of climate refugees. And when we really look at it and the work we've done with our Tangata Pacifica whanaunga, is that what we're seeing is a movement of whanau from one part of Mononui Akiwa to another part. A thousand years ago, our ancestors left the islands of the Pacific and we made Aotearoa home. Post-World War II, we had a massive influx of our Pacifica whānau. And what we're about to see, and we think about our relations in Kiribati, uh, Tokelau and Tuvalu, is the opportunity to welcome our whanaunga home. Not treat them like um, climate refugees. And, and just in closing, you know, the territory is important in the bicultural, binocular relationship. Um, Oranga Motuhake is the driver for Māori, and we don't need a treaty for that. But what it does help, and, and a number of our speakers talks about a partnering framework. And if you read the preamble, the treaty is also Aotearoa's first immigration policy in acknowledging not only those that were here and coming, but those that are continuing. And so the concept of tangata tiriti that's starting to become more um, relevant is really important. And, and certainly in terms of that question of what can our Pākehā whanaunga do, um, look up treatypeople.org or look up um, heathercaimassociates.com Dr Heather Kane. Now they're tangata tiriti advocates, practitioners, and they take responsibility in enabling, empowering, and educating Pākehā. Because we've got enough regenerating we need to do as a people. Uh, we're there to be allies and to support, but we're not there to be the source of all your answers. And there's some real awesome tangata tiriti people there. Because we've got to um, start to build those relationships in a way, um, and there's awesome um, te tangata tiriti navigators that can help enable that journey. So, uh, e roto o tēnā e mihi kāna, kia, kia koutou, kia tātou, 
nō reira tēnā tate katoa. Kia ora. Um, tēnā koe te tōkana. Uh, e kore ngā kupu, it's, it's hard to really summarise that, um, but what I take from that is that health can be more about than just the absence of disease. It can be about balance, it can be about integration, and about us as Indigenous people having the solutions to some of the issues that we face. Um, and we can lay that over the health system in terms of making sure that it's effective and responsive to us and our needs as Indigenous people and for maintaining the integrity of Papatua Nuku. Uh, no reira, um, at that juncture, now we will um, open the floor up for questions on the Slido. Um, does anyone have any partai um, that they would like to put forward? Going once. Well, why, the, why, the, why, why, um, why those come through, I would just like to also acknowledge that I subscribe to the same school as thought. Um, my tuakana here refers to it as open time. I think the technical term is Māori time, and I will, um, I will do my best to, um, to get us through. Uh, we have one. So the part we have here is, do you think Māori need to embody circular thinking first before society is able to catch up, or is this something everyone can do together? Um, that, that's a really good question. I often get the question in reverse um, about the re indigeneity of Pākehā. Um, and, and I think that's why I use the term recirculisation. So for Māori, it's recirculising, it's return. And, and often we see that language around shifting to a circular. Um, and, and certainly I would suggest that Māori are doing it. Um, we, we've been doing it since day dot. Um, and I think one of the key distinctions, if you like, is the distinction between uh, Māori systems thinking, or mātaranga Māori, and Māori as a population. And there's a confusion between, um, and we confuse the state of Māori as a people with Māori systems thinking. They're connected, but they're quite distinct. And so we need to sort of explore what do we mean by recycling and circles. Um, I think the real opportunity, because for the last 150 odd years it's been a square system trying to engage with a circle system. What's really exciting, and, and I guess what I'm suggesting in response to the question, is two pathways, a dual pathway, a parallel pathway, that will converge and be resolved through whakapapa, through our mokopuna. And, and in our recirculisation of our people, as Māori, the shift to secular systems for Western thinking is really critical because then that will form that actual binocular view. I think over time, we'll actually converge to have a real Aotearoa system. Because when we talk about the Westernisation of Aotearoa, it's a particular system that came from Westminster. We weren't colonised by the Spanish, the Portuguese, the Dutch or the French or the Americans. We have a British tradition of colonisation. So, so and we've all spoken across the speakers about the need to shift the system. So it's like two shifts and then a confluence, like two awa coming together. That, that's the opportunity. And don't think, and someone talked about being patient. So this is over generations, not tomorrow. And we've got to do it at least three generations together. So the importance of our young people who we follow their footprints in the way they challenge us is we've got to also bring our elders in. Whether we're whakapapa whānau or kaupapa whānau, we, we need at least three generations working together at the same time. None of this demographic youth thing and climate strikes. And, you know, and that's one of the success that's happened in Tāmaki is our elders that have sat with our young people to, to co-navigate this space together. So, so we're thinking a long game um, while there's sort of urgency, um, but it doesn't have to be a rush. I do Ironman stuff, endurance stuff, so they have this funny term called rush slowly. <laughs> so we've got to move off pace, but we've got to be in the time and enable us to go through each step without 
becoming too fatigued, you know, and, and, and um, our speakers in India spoke about the need to restore and replenish. So because it's a long, it took generations to get here. It's why there's a critical timeline, but it's beyond that that we need to think about. Kia ora. Um, we uh, have another question is, do you want to come work at the University of Otago? No. <laughs> no, sorry, um, we do have a couple more questions, Fano, but um, I see we need to move on in terms of time to the next presentation. So if you do have that question, um, I know they're coming through. Um, so I think we'll wind up there, but um, do um, catch up with Johnny in the break um, if you would like to have any further questions. On. Um, so moving on, our next speaker is Victoria Black, who is currently Acting Head of Sustainability for Te Whatu Order Health New Zealand and has been the project lead for their climate change working group since November 2021, currently taking a national lens to her work. Victoria also spends a lot of time engaging locally in environmental spaces, including climate risk, adaptation, biodiversity, transport solutions and waste. With a bachelor's degree in business management and a master's in environmental management, Victoria brings a balanced approach to organisational sustainability with a strong theme of environment first. Um, she is also very focused on what the future will look like for her son and his children and does her best to make sure, a hope, to make sure that hopeful solutions focused approach to resilience, sustainability and emissions reduction. Um, Nō reira, Victoria, no mai harapa. Kia ora. Koutou te mana maunga, koutou te mana awa. Koto te mana whenua o Taranaki Fanui me Ngāti Toa Rangatira. Nei rā te mahi mai oha ki a koto katoa, tēnā koutou. Nō wai tēnei e tū ana, i whanau mai a haui he te tonga i te mātou a Maui. Nō ronga mai wahi ne tāku tāma, uh, kei tauranga moana a hau i noho ana. Ko au te kaihau te whakauka mō te whatuora, ko Victoria Black toko wangawa. It is a genuine privilege to be here speaking today and I just want to acknowledge the over 100 people online um, as well as all of the people out there in the hubs that are joining us at this conference. Uh, Johnny, you are a hard act to follow so I will do my best, uh, no pressure. I also just wanted to um, shout out to India. Um, some of the photos that she shared of our coast um, remind her of my birthplace in Homawana. Um, so I don't know if any of you have stood on the beach at Homoana and seen what the ocean is doing there. Um, but when I visited there most recently, um, I stood on the beach and, and stood at the house that I used to live in where the ocean is to the back door. And I thought, I wonder if this is why I'm doing what I'm doing. I'm sure it's one of the reasons, it's not the reason. So before we talk about the solutions, we really do need to understand the, pro uh, the problem. In Aotearoa, New Zealand, a healthy environment is integral to tangata whenua. Linked to whakapapa, the natural environment is considered a taonga under Article 2 of Te Tiriti o Waitangi. Needing protection is part of our Te Tiriti obligations. By acknowledging ka ora te taiao, ka ora te tangata, the inherent connection between a well environment and human health and well-being, we also acknowledge the whakapapa of tangata whenua to the natural environment and their role as kaitiaki. More generally, we start to feel more connected to our environment when we recognise that we are a part of nature and not apart from it. And recognise that any degradation of the natural environment or relationships with the environment can have consequences for hauora or holistic health and well-being. When we adopt this worldview, it can have significant impacts on our decision making and the way we work. 
Climate change is recognised as a determinant of health in pie order, the health legislation. We are no longer arguing if it is a thing. We are trying to understand how this thing will impact on our ability to deliver publicly funded health services, including the impacts it will have on our communities, our workforce and our infrastructure. How the health system will ensure its resilience to climate change is an action of the Ministry for the Environment's National Adaptation Plan, and conversations have commenced more broadly in this space. But we know that all aspects of climate change, positive or negative, direct or indirect, have an impact on health and well-being. While we need to plan for climate change adaptation, we cannot slow down in our mitigation activities. Even under current commitments that we're internationally not on track to meet, our children will see significantly more weather events, um, more weather-related disruption than we or our parents did. This is a really striking figure that comes out of the IPCC's most recent report. And I think for many of us in this room, we are born 1980, speaking for myself. Um, some younger, some older, but most of us are around that space. A lot of our decision makers were born, born earlier than this, and they haven't seen the temperature journey that we've seen. Even in a best case scenario, which is the very low scenario there, which is we're not on track to meet. Things are looking pretty bleak. Um, if we look at the very high scenario, which is basically the status quo, it's looking considerably worse. Climate change impacts are unequal and disproportionately affect populations that have contributed the least to the problem. Climate change interacts with existing social and economic inequalities and exacerbates long-standing trends within and between countries. The most vulnerable groups include children, elderly, lower socioeconomic groups, those with chronic diseases, and isolated and indigenous communities. Carbon intensive policies and practices are synergistic. For example, contribute to poor health quality, poor food quality, and poor housing quality. On the flip side of this, climate action activities generally have pop, uh, positive public health outputs. Um, mode shift is an example of that. We cannot maintain the status quo. We need to make change now. We must work together to change the system. This is a terrible slide because you can't read anything. You could when I looked at it earlier. This is the breakdown of Te Whata Water's emissions footprint. Um, this is an estimated footprint based on assumptions of about 10 DHBs. And just a shout out to my colleagues, I'll show you some photos of them later. You can see from here that the bulk of our emissions um, come from energy. This is hospital centric. We also know, and similar to um, our colleagues from the PHO, that um, patient visitors travel and staff commute could potentially double this footprint and that procurement and supply chain could also, um, also has a huge impact. But we're not measuring those things at the moment. This is an estimation of the problem, but we're working to understand what the actual um, problem is. So what are we doing about it? Um, we, we, as I said, we have a real understanding of the connection between climate and health and population health. We've created an interim work program leading to 2025 and, and recognise, as do the board, um, the genuine opportunity for systemic change we have by Te Whata Water merging our 20 DHBs together. We genuinely have an opportunity and we've seen those opportunities already as we take a national approach, ensuring, about, um, ensuring equitable resourcing um, across the motu and not just focusing on areas that have the um, expertise, experience or funding in place. Um, I quite like this line I added, with great size comes great responsibility, and any of you um, who are fans of any superheroes should appreciate that one as well. But we do have a huge responsibility, and I acknowledge that everybody in the room and online um, expects us to fulfil this responsibility well. There are broader opportunities, um, but one of the key things we're working on right now is the fact that you can't manage what you don't measure. We are lucky to have guidance under the Carbon Neutral Government Program, which came out of the Zero Carbon Act. Um, we must set and meet targets in line with a 1.5 degree pathway, and if we ever look at this image and see sort of where we're tracking at the moment, which is in the grey, and then look at that green line, which is, you know, where 1.5 degrees is, and look at that gap. 
That is the gap that we need to close, and that's a significant gap. Um, Te Whatuora has uh, directions under the Carbon Neutral Government Program, and we have endorsed an, an implementation policy which will enable us to work towards meeting those targets. We do have a significant team that are working on this, but actually this is the requirement of all parts of the system. It's not just up to the sustainability team to fix this. We need to look at all parts of, um, of our organisation and what we're doing. We are doing uh, emissions reporting. Um, so we are measuring our footprint at the moment. We're taking a phased approach um, to this because it is quite a big job. It was a big job at a DHB level, so I'm sure you can imagine from a system level that's quite significant. We are working to meet um, ISO standards and, and greenhouse gas protocol standards as well. And as I said, we have the implementation policy and directions available to us through CNGP and the MFE um, guidance. Um, so we are currently including core hospital emissions um, and a subset of patient travel. The next phases will include additional value chain sources, um, including some significant sources such as staff commute, patient private travel, procurement and embodied um, building emissions and food. This is that, this is that phased approach. Um, the slides will be available so you can look at these later for more information. Um, the other thing that is of, is of interest and importance is the fact that we will be doing quite significant reporting. So we will have um, information available in Te Whatuora's first annual report. Um, we will also be releasing a really exciting um, publication alongside this year's annual report celebrating 10 years of sustainable health care in DHB. So shout out to the team that are working on that. Um, and we're also doing quarterly reporting or working on quarterly reporting up to the board due to the significance of this issue. We have within the team, um, so the sustainability team sits within the office of the chief executive in Te Whatuora. We have three key uh, functions. One is around strategy and policy, um, setting up a framework for how we manage environmental sustainability and climate resilience, climate risk and adaptation power. Uh, planning, sorry, and policy review and alignment, so making sure that all of our policies are climate policies. We also have responsibilities for planning, monitoring and reporting, um, particularly monitoring our um, achievement of directions under the National Adaptation Plan and the Carbon Neutral Government Program. And we're also there to provide implementation support, which seems like a pretty big task. But thankfully I have this wonderful group of humans to help. Um, and they're all dotted around the room too, so look out for them. And if you need anything, um, have a chat with them. Just want to shout out that uh, one of our members isn't in the room today, and you'll see why shortly. Our work is broken down into three work streams. Health system decarbonisation, which is around de de reducing our emissions, basically. Environment and all practices, which is looking at the way that we're doing business. This is where a lot of our waste reduction and circular economy work fits in here. And then obviously the, the uh, ability for the health system to be resilient and adapt to climate change. We've got some really exciting work happening in infrastructure and I don't want to talk too much about it, but some of the exciting announcements that we've had this year is the $99 million energy transition program um, that is co-funded through the State Sector Decarbonisation Fund. We have a commitment to removing all coal-fired um, energy from the health estate by 2025. And uh, there is some really awesome work happening in design guidance for our infrastructure and building. So shout out to Debbie, who you will meet later on, um, who's had a lot to do with that work. Shout outs too down to Christchurch um, and to our friend and colleague Tim Empson. Um, Christchurch coal um, has been replaced and it's saving around 20,000 tonne of carbon emissions or greenhouse gas emissions, which is twice Bay of Plenty's current measured footprint. Right, so that's really, really significant. As soon as we see coal gone, we are going to be seeing some really significant reduction. There is a lot happening in the coal space um, in the South Island. Um, and yeah, it's just shout outs to the energy managers that are working down there, working really hard to um, get that happening. 
Just back to the team stuff that I forgot to mention is that we hold key relationships across the organisations and, and energy managers, um, facilities managers, clinical staff and so many others are really critical for us to be able to get any of this work done. And just wanted to also note that we are members of Global Green and Healthy Hospitals and the Sustainable Business Council as well which also helps us with some of that journey. Green building is pretty cool and I'm super stoked about this and I'm not going to talk too much about this one either. Um, but the, um, this building, which is Taranaki's new renal build, was recognised um, for excellence in both the Civic Health and Arts category and the build, uh, Green Building category at the New Zealand Property Industry Awards um, on the 23rd of June. Earlier in the month, it also took out the Public Architecture category at the 2023 Western Architecture Awards in New Plymouth um, and was named the winner of the prestigious Healthcare Design um, Trophy in the European Healthcare Design Awards. So that's really cool, but also it um, has a target to be one of the world's first zero carbon and zero energy certified healthcare facilities. So cool, right? And, and it's, amazing, it's an amazing place for people to work and for patients to be because that's the feedback that we're getting. So not only are we reducing carbon emissions and are we reducing the energy we need to use these buildings and those types of things, but people actually enjoy being in them. And we need to be patient and whanau centred in all of the things that we're doing, right? And that's how we, that's how we really do embody that wellness. We're on an awesome journey to convert our fleet. Um, and this is in all of the vehicles because we've got around 400 um, EVs, we've got around 4,000 in total. So just to give you a bit of context there, but we're getting there. Um, EVs are not the solution for transport, don't get me wrong. But we do need to be able to get out to our communities and so this is a better way for us to do it than by using um, ice vehicles. And some, oh, Desflurane. So just shout outs uh, to the anaesthetists in the room. Um, I can see one. I'm sorry if there's others, but the work that's happened in the removal of desflurane from the system, we're at 95% reduction um, since 2025, and that's pretty significant. So as you can see, the blue line there is the emissions from, from desflurane. And a thank you to Marguerite for sharing um, this information, and a huge thank you to the um, anaesthetics teams for the work they've been doing in this space that they've driven um, to reduce these um, emissions. Some other cool stuff. So this person on the um, on the bed here is the wonderful Katie Hine, who isn't in the room today. And we just want to welcome young Freddie to our team, who joined the world on Sunday morning. Um, Waikato Hospital is one of um, the hospitals that has been trialling nitrous oxide destruction units in their birthing suites. Um, nitrous oxide, you may know, combined with 50% oxygen, is um, as Entinox is used in abundance in delivery units around Aotearoa. Um, and where it provides safe, effective and predictable pain relief for labouring um, women. The system is simple to use, a single mouthpiece that allows people to inhale Entinox on demand, um, empowering them to take control and manage their own pain relief. However, there's a dark side to nitrous oxide. While it's safe in short exposure times um, where, when it's used for labour, um, there are health concerns regarding prolonged exposure to midwives um, and it's a huge environmental pollutant responsible for over 90% of a hospital's carbon footprint from medical gases. These destruction units are a great option as they help to reduce the impact of nitrous oxide. Um, they're as simple to use as the current systems that we're using and they use a catalytic process I had to read that one, um, to break down the nitrous oxide into its components, um, you know, significantly lowering, lowering the emissions um, from this. So these are just some of the, the innovations that are out there that we're using. So again, not saying technology is the answer, but in some cases it is. Um, we've also been doing heaps of other cool stuff. I'm really excited about um, this, so I've put this up for anyone who's data geeks and planning geeks, just because I am one of those, but this is, um, and none of this means anything, it's really just showing that we've got this really cool tool that we've adopted that can help us to map out what the different scenarios are and decisions that we're going to be making, um, and that is very exciting for me, um, so that when we are making decisions um, on business cases and things, we can be mapping out those emissions reductions and really seeing um, what the benefits are. We are building in decision making 
um, to environmental practices. So this might be familiar to some of you. It is like the waste hierarchy, but we've sort of tweaked it um, to be more of a decision-making hierarchy for climate resilience and environmental sustainability. Um, I won't go into detail on this, but basically we need to start asking different questions um, and working down the line to see, you know, if, okay, well, if we have to do that, then we, do we have to do it this way? Um, I think some of the things that we get is a bit, we get a bit anti-change, but I've always done it like this, and actually we just can't afford to be thinking like that anymore. We can't do it how we've always done it, because look at where we are. Um, we've got a bunch of policy, so I do talk about policy, and I do think that policy enables us. I know that I, I feel really lucky that uh, central government agencies have the carbon neutral government program where local government doesn't have those drivers um, because it really has enabled us to take this quite seriously. We've also got a bunch, bunch of other strategy that guides our decision making. Um, so yeah, that's probably enough about that. We're also doing some pretty cool stuff in circular economy and waste already. Um, and this is the stuff that our staff really care about. Like if you walk into a hospital, um, you will notice, you know, if you're ever admitted, um, you will notice the waste, you'll notice the plastic. Uh, we get complaints about it all the time. The staff really care about it and we're working on it. We do have some barriers um, due to infection prevention and control. Um, but we are working constantly to find solutions to reduce the environmental impact and that is why we talk about environmental sustainability and climate resilience because it's not just about emissions it's also about environmental degradation and we all know that plastics are a real concern in our environment oh nearly there last one i only got three work streams and this is the final one so we're doing pretty well this actually is one that is quite close to my heart which is around climate risk and adaptation the health sector has some directions in the National Adaptation Plan um, and we are leading quite a few of those at Te Whata Water. We already understand climate risk reasonably well um, with the National Climate Change Risk Assessment. Territorial authorities are doing their risk assessments. We've done some ourselves as, as um, in health with the Northern Region, Hauru Toy Bay of Plenty and a National Infrastructure Risk Screening. We know that health service delivery is disrupted and we've seen that recently um, through Cyclone Gabriel. Infrastructure related risks exist. We have um, risks to supply chain that COVID has also um, shown us. There's risks around transition and the way we're changing the practice that we're doing. There's impacts on our workforce and obviously on our community. We need to make sure that a health and wellbeing lens is being applied across climate risk um, assessments and we need to plan for the risks that we're aware of. We are doing that. So one of the actions in the NAP is uh, climate health action plans and we're working at the moment to provide national guidance to ensure that these plans are able to be done um, regionally, locally, whichever the, um, the best mechanism is. We've been doing some discovery work to understand what we think needs to be in these um, plans. And the next uh, step really is to name a working group and start to think about who's going to lead this, who's going to be involved, and, and really what these um, plans are going to mean. And, and, and finally, we're working on health care uh, sector climate change scenarios. So a number of you in the room um, will be involved in this through your organisations. We've got around 20 agencies, um, government and non-government, engaged in this at the moment. Uh, this is aligned to the XRB uh, climate-related disclosures, where we will be creating three scenarios, one at 1.5 degrees, one at 3 degrees, and, and another scenario. And we're really focusing for us on health impacts. So what are the expected health impacts at 1.5 degrees? What are the expected health impacts at 3 degrees? Um, and, and, and the other, because we need to be planning for those impacts. We know that it's going to Im impact on aged care. So what are those impacts likely to be? What are the health issues that we might be facing under these scenarios? Thank you. That's quite a lot. Um, well, it was lots of slides, but we did it. Um, kia ora te tua hine mō o kōrero uh, whakahirihira. Um, so we have time for one quick question. What other efforts are going into reducing traffic generation across health? Traffic generation? 
Okay. Um, that's a really good question. So we are strong advocates for telehealth and healthcare in the community, obviously in the sustainability team. Um, telehealth was introduced through COVID, where it was quite successful, and we are working to ensure, uh, we're well, working alongside our data and digital colleagues that are actually leading the telehealth charge um, to, to work on that. We know that um, parking at hospitals is a nightmare. We're not huge fans of cars. We're trying to enable other ways of accessing healthcare and we will be providing guidance around travel planning um, and ensuring that most of our large district hospitals have some sort of travel plan in place where people are able to engage in other forms of transport that aren't single occupancy private vehicles. Hopefully that answers that question. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. Um, thanks. <laughs> Um, okay, Fano. Um, it's now um, time to move into the poster session. So we have um, what we're going to do is we're going to give four presenters three minutes to describe their posters, um, and these will be up in the foyer afterwards and online for viewing for those of you at home or at the hubs. So um, I would like to call on our first pre presenter, Sylvia Boys. Um, to um, take the stage. Thanks everyone and thanks for the three minutes to present. So I'm going to take advantage of speaking quickly. Um, I'm an emergency medicine physician. Got a bit sick of being a bottom of the cliff doctor, dealing with all those social determinants of health. Went off and did a postgraduate diploma in population health. Um, and in, in environmental health. Um, I'm also a Ken Asim's member, and I think during that work I made myself a little bit annoying to Margie Upper, who, when Auckland Council wanted a health representative to talk with them about their climate change adaption um, sort of policy that they were developing, aiming at a three degree warming scenario, Margie sent me off to, to do that. And my notes have just frozen out because I've gone. <sighs> So hence, um, I was thinking about how do we adapt to climate change, and what I'm going to talk about is a small part of that work, which is vector-based um, disease, and how do we mitigate against this predominantly mosquito-based disease. Um, so one of the key public health models is that of host, vector, agent, and environment. So I'm taking all of those different components to look at how to um, mitigate against this. And we're, in the next few decades, going to be warm enough for Anopheles and Aedes mosquitoes, carries of malaria, and many other arboroviruses, dengue, Zika, um, chikungunya, um, and especially Ross River virus. And that one we've already got the mosquito here for. Um, and there are many different disease cycles with these vectors. Some are just mosquito and human. They're kind of easier to mitigate because you can stop the humans being bitten, or in the case of malaria, you can treat the human and you interrupt the cycle. But in some ways, the more difficult ones are where the many mammalian animals that we have can also be vectors, and you get amplification as the mosquitoes bite those animals and the cycle increases. So they're a bit more challenging. And particularly um, Ross River virus, the one we already have the mosquito for, um, one of its vectors is possums and our other pests. Hmm, you see the problem. Um, right, um, Ross River, for example, causes, like all the other arboreoviruses, fever, rash, joint pains can last for months, no specific treatment, none of these have vaccines available, um, which is why prevention is, is important if we can manage it. Dengue is probably the one that makes the virus that makes people the worst. So what mitigation strategies can we have? Well, it would be great if we could control total temperature, but we need the rest of the world to come to the party there and we're on track to a higher emissions scenario. So we've got issues around housing, mosquito screens, that can help reduce the number of bites because it tends to be at night. Good insulation also reduces mosquitoes. Good waste management. The mosquito species that we're talking about are floodwater species that breed very easily in very small amounts of water. Their eggs resist drying out, they persist for ages. They're quite different to our native mosquitoes. And I initially was going to talk this, uh, describe this talk as um, celebrating our culex, our native species of mosquitoes. Um, we need to put in place bite prevention behaviours at a people level. 
and medical is interacting with treatment to keep people well, but also to prevent bites when people are infected and to recognise and treat malaria earlier. And that's going to be a real challenge to the health system when these diseases, when the mosquito and the disease does become established, we just don't recognise it. But most exciting to me is the environmental control. You know, New Zealand split from Gondwanaland 80 million years ago. We were, for 80 million years, a land of birds. We didn't have mammals. Our mosquitoes evolved to this. They bite preferentially birds. Our mosquitoes breed better in natural river systems and natural lakes and waterways. Um, they deal with the tannins from the trees and the water. They cope with the cooler environment. They eat the same food sources most of the time as the imported nasty mosquitoes, being nectar and such forth. They can outcompete. If we convert our streams from dirty, polluted things to clean waterways, a Matarangi Māori principle, we actually create an environment where we select for our native mosquitoes and make it much harder for imported mosquitoes to gain hold. And I think this is probably the big message I, I think we should take home from here. Um, in addition, water management infrastructure becomes really important, preventing flooding bite prevention, um, and um, the other thing with the natural streams is we also get our natural marine predators are selected for, and we keep mosquito numbers under control. If, the, if that all fails, we've got some wonderful biological technology that's come about. Well, back here is an endosymbiont, big long word, it's a bacteria that lives within the cells of insects, and like our mitochondria, is passed down through the generations. Well, Bacchia provides protection against viral um, replication and so it can actually block transmission of mosquito-based viruses. Um, we can introduce mosquitoes with that that outcompete the other mosquitoes that, are, that if they've become established to control dengue. It's worked well overseas. Thank you so much for your time. I'm Kira Sylvia. I'd now like to call on Gabriel Arnold. Is Gabriel with us or? I know my heart of mine. Tēnā koutou everyone, um, ko Gabby toko ingoa. And um, I'd just like to start by acknowledging all the knowledge that's already been shared this morning. What a privilege um, to be here today. So, um, by 2028 in Aotearoa, the population of those aged 65 years and older is estimated to reach 1 million. With this, adult incontinence products are expected to contribute to landfills four to ten times more that than infant diapers. So, we're talking about diapers here today. In incontinence products contain plastic, fibres, superabsorbent polymers and cellulose, which once in landfill create risks to surrounding ecosystems due to microplastics and leachate. The manufacturing process of incontinence products is also significantly energy intensive. The question lies, how can single-use incontinence products support both people and planet when they utilise finite resources and put pressure on a warming climate? This is a discussion we need to have now. So, what alternatives are there to single-use adult incontinence products? On the poster, you'll see a waste minimisation hierarchy that was informed by a narrative literature review and interviews with the Aote Porti campus Kaiafina residential care home sustainability advisors, CEOs of overseas sanitary waste recycling factories, and a zero waste expert. The report also touched on alternatives to personal protective equipment and residential care facilities, where recommendations followed a similar pattern to the hierarchy we're focusing on today. So at the top, pelvic floor muscle exercises. This is there because to prevent um, sanitary waste, we could decrease the use for it in the first place. Pelvic floor muscle exercises have been found to decrease incontinence episodes or cure incontinence altogether. Second, reusing. With reusable products, individual sanitary waste landfill contributions could decrease annually by up to 86%. Cotton incontinence products may also improve the whole or quality of life for individuals experiencing incontinence. Third, recycling. Sanitary waste recycling factories are established in countries such as Australia and America. Sanitary products are shredded, sanitised and tra transitioned into alternative products such as pet pellets. Fourth, organic decomposition. Overseas trials have had varying success in composting, anaerobically digesting or metabolising diapers with fungi, such as oyster mushrooms. 
These mushrooms were deemed fit for human consumption, but I don't think we'll be seeing it in any restaurant menus uh, anytime soon. Um, fifth, uh, bio, uh, textile alternatives, which are bio-based products. These are deemed expensive and worse for the environment due to increased methane production once in landfills. They also have minimal evidence of their ability to be successfully composted. Landfill, the current default disposal method in Aotearoa. To nurture papa tua nuku and te taiao, this must change. And last, incineration, or burn. Incineration is a waste demanding system and does not encourage waste minimization, which is a vital component of reducing the current impact of today's linear systems. Excitingly, uh, one residential care home who sponsored this project is now trying to find a way to implement a pelvic floor muscle exercise program in their facility, and another, another was trialling worm farm decomposition of such sanitary products. I'd just like to say a thank you to Ray O'Brien and Aveen Horsfield, who's up the back, um, and the Otago University Sustainability Office for the opportunity of the summer internship, um, and to the sponsors Avida, Bupa, Somerset, MetLife Care, and Oceania Healthcare. Kia ora, thank you. Uh, kia ora, Sylvia, thank you very much. And lastly, I'd like to call on Benedict Kaliwa um, for presentation number four. Do we have Benedict in the house? We do. Kia ora all, um, I'm Benedict, I'm a first year house surgeon here in Wellington. Um, so as part of my, as part of my studies last year in my elective, uh, I did this, so it's the Planetary Health Report Card is what it's known as. It's basically created in 2019 by a bunch of students in America. Uh, the goal is that it looks to somehow quantify how we do in the realm of uh, curriculum, research, etc. Various forms of operation that the medical school does and how it prepares us as the medics of the future to actually run the system once upon a time in the future. So, why did I do it? So I guess I, it's been something in, I've been interested in for a while. I mean, planetary health is probably the biggest thing that's going to influence the world and human health for our generation. It's gonna be the defining thing and look at my despair to see as I go through med school, we didn't really ever talk about it. It was kind of just ignored. We had maybe two lectures in the first three years and I think we might have had a week in the fourth year and you know what? That's probably not good enough. So, no offense to any Otago people here, sorry, we can do better, but um, I thought we'd take a look at it. So, connected in with the people in America basically via Caroline, who helped me out a little with this, and yeah, got cracking on it. So I did three cards across Wellington, Dunedin, and Christchurch. Um, they're pretty similar, relatively speaking. I mean, a lot of the content is actually delivered from Dunedin. It's Otago Medical School, so, you know, relatively speaking. But, so as part of this, I basically trawled through all of the the content that was delivered had a bunch of interviews with a whole bunch of academics there, talked to lots of people at the sustainability office and created a score out of this. So what does it actually show? Um, we're actually not too bad. I think I was being dramatic probably in my original despair a little bit, but we could definitely do better. So for context, I've put up some comparison scores in the bottom right. Um, yeah. C, C minus, it's a pass, I guess, right? So, <laughs> um, curriculum in particular was, you know, relatively middle of the road. I think, I guess curriculum is the most heavily weighted thing, and I guess the reason for that being is twofold. One is that as a medical school, the teaching that we have is how we're actually going to engage as, as medics and help people with their health. And knowing what planetary health is going to do to people's health is really important. I mean, even this year, um, floods in Hawke's Bay, a few years ago you have huge fires in Aussie. What does that actually mean? And with, I guess we're also gonna be one day, 
we will also run the health system. Give it 20 years and we're going to be the ones at the top and so we better actually know something about what we're doing. So we should probably start now. Thank you. <laughs> Kia ora, Benedict. Thank you. Um, whanau, nā kutehe, um, my bad earlier. We have one more presenter. I got Sylvia confused with Sylvia earlier. Uh, we have another Sylvia. Um, Sylvia Purdy, uh, no maharamai. Lucky last for afternoon tea. Tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Uh, mihi nui ki te kaupapa me ngā kai whakahaere o te hui nei. Uh, mihi ahi atu ki te whare nei, tōku kura i ngā hoa o mua. Uh, no ko uh, te awa kairangi, te awa uh, tangata te riti, te iwi. Uh, ko ihu karaiti te tangata, ko Sylvia Purdy ahau. I have established a place consultancy to resource the community and health sectors in sustainability and climate strategy. I work with organisations whose core business is manaki tangata, caring for people. So this is at the heart. Lovely rainbow. And each organisation brings your own uh, focus and kaupapa to what manaki tangata looks like uh, in your space. My approach seems to, seeks to integrate both bicultural and sustainability practices. Rather than seeing these as tag-ons or compliance obligations, manaki tanga helps us in this, I believe. I, invite organisations to care for the environment, ia rā, ia rā, every day. As the earth and the heavens manaki us, so we can respond in reciprocal relationship. As India said earlier, relationships of obligation. So that we do not just take from the natural world or take taiao for granted. Care for whenua means, as we've been hearing today, putting less rubbish into the land. Sustainability planning often for organisations begins with what goes in the bin. And so we reduce waste, we grow in integrity and celebrate every achievement. Care for the atmosphere means burning less fossil fuels. And this starts with recording carbon emissions. As Victoria said, we, measure, we, we can manage what we measure. I promote a new social enterprise called OTIS. Uh, our actions tell a story, OTIS, which provides online tools and uh, ways to tell your story in order to reduce your carbon footprint. So manaki whenua and manaki rangi ways to frame climate mitigation. But there's so much more that we can do. I encourage organisations to grow partnerships and projects around biodiversity and growing food and caring for local places. We know, don't we, that getting out into nature is good for people. Being active, connected with beauty, water, birds, these are health co-benefits, good for us and good for the planet, manaki oranga. Summer gave us that beautiful example of healthy housing for both human and non-human beings as a matauranga Māori co-benefit. And on the other side, manaki kaimahi, we care for our staff. It helps attract and keep good people when your organisation enables kaimahi to express their concern for the environment in their work. I'm passionate about professional development and networks, collective advocacy, a collaboration that India, India named as allyship, allyship. These strengthen the modi, strengthen the resilience and capacity of the organisation, which enables us to prepare for climate change. Whakareri prepare community-based climate adaptation. People at the heart, 
communities empowered to act. So I'd love to talk to you. I have been given an extra minute uh, to talk about another little uh, part of my role. I also uh, work as a counsellor and a supervisor and a church minister. I'm on the executive of Ora Taiao, and I am uh, coordinating a, a national network around mental health and climate change. And I have a couple of... Um, a couple of clipboards, I'm just going to put them over there. You might like to uh, add your name as you go out if you'd like to uh, get my newsletter or if you'd like to be invited to a mental health online kōrero. Nō reira, kia ora. Thank you. Um, kia ora, Sylvie, and um, to all of our presenters, um, nei rā timi, nei rā timi hi mai awa, kia koutou katoa. Um, thank you. So that's the end of the poster session, Fano, and we're now going to take afternoon tea. Um, for those of you on site, um, you'll be able to view the posters again out here in the foyer. And um, for those of you online, there will be a link made available so that you can um, have a look there. And we encourage you to network with the, the poster presenters and with each other, Fano, as, um, as we head out for a kai. And, um, and we'll be reconvening at 3.30. So um, on that note, please make your way down. For those of us here, go have a kai. A tēnā tātou whānau. A nau mai hara mai, whakatata mai ki tō tātou kaupapa. A ko te tai au tangata, haura. And welcome back everybody um, here in the theatre and everyone on Zoom and in our hubs. Um, we're carrying on with our theme of restoring the Modi, And this is the idea of our of our relationships to the places that we participate and belong to, whether that's a landscape, an ecosystem, a workplace, and the idea that if we can work towards restoring these, that we can enhance the health and the modi of the people that participate in them. Now, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Associate Professor Jemima Tiatia. Um, she is the Pro Vice Chancellor Pacific and an Associate Professor in Pacific Studies at Waipapa Taumataro University of Auckland. Um, she is of Samoan descent and has a community and public health background. She was one of six panellists on the New Zealand Government 2018 Mental Health and Addiction Inquiry and is a board member for the nation's inaugural Mental Health and Wellbeing Commission. Her research interests include Pacific Studies, Mental Health, Wellbeing, Pacific Suicide Prevention and Postvention, Youth Development, Climate Change and Health Inequities. Um, no reira e te whanau, um, hara mai um, e te tuahine. Um, Mālo le tau i whua, mā malangi mā, um, whakalo whala hi atu, mālo le le, Nisan Bulevanaka, uh, Noia Modi, uh, kia ora tato kato toa, uh, o angwe, um, and warmest Pacific greetings, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tato katoa. First I'd like to acknowledge the manu whenua, um, e, uh, manganuia tāra. I also want like to acknowledge um, the manu wahine that I had lunch with today. Thank you both for your wisdom shared. Um, and Johnny, um, I really appreciated your kōrero and thank you for your warm hospitality to your whanaunga. Um, yes, so I'm here to talk about the inseparable connection. You have heard previous speakers talk about um, the ways in which Pacific and Māori uh, conceptualise uh, the climate, uh, climate change and the environment. You'll see that we have a team here um, and <clears throat> one of the speakers, uh, Professor Alistair Woodward, uh, is an integral part of the team and, and he'll be speaking tomorrow. Um, a fairly young team and the, and the reasoning behind that is obviously to grow Pacific research capacity and capabilities. Um, so we've heard already that you know, to Pacific peoples, I will only speak on behalf of um, the Pacific world views, and there are many, and there is a deep and inseparable connection. And it does go beyond, you know, um, just belonging. And it's deeply entrenched in our psyche, in our epistemologies, our ways of knowing, being, and doing. 
The ocean, for example, is a living entity. For some of us, it's our tupuna, it's our ancestors, it's a god. It's somewhere where we cleanse ourselves of any toxicity or anything that doesn't serve us in this world. So the ocean is more than just a body of water. Um, our creation stories, and there are thousands of them across the Pacific, tell how the ocean was formed, and we consider it to be a miasina or a taonga, um, a treasure that should be protected and preserved. I mean, our environment was never meant to be feared. We were never meant to be scared of it. But instead, we were to revere it and protect it and embrace it. Um, we have scientific knowledge, and some of that scientific knowledge we've heard today and we'll most likely hear tomorrow. Um, but we have to think outside the box in, in lots of ways and consider our positionality and where we are in the world and in the Pacific. Um, so this is, a, I'm going to speak today about an HRC funded project that I led. Um, it has come, to, literally has just come to a close. And it is talking about the nexus between mental health and well-being and climate change. Um, two global giants, and we consider that it is indeed not two separate, um, I guess, phenomena. <laughs> what is... Especially important, about, especially important about this project is that it was Pacific led. And as I mentioned, we had research assistants that we were able to place in, in different sites, um, and they were locals. And it wasn't, and, and my, my vision for the project was not merely to have young research assistants that would beef up my credentials or any of the credentials of the senior members of the team instead. It was having the ability and the courage and humility to step back so the next generation are then able to lead and to work with our strong allies. And also not going into the Pacific and telling them what to do. <laughs> I'd like to acknowledge HRC, obviously, our research collabor collaborators in the three research sites, Cook Islands here in Aotearoa, uh, Christchurch mainly, because um, during that time it was the, you know, post-earthquake, and obviously the Cook Islands and UN governments. Now this project was done during lockdown, so you can imagine that well, the borders were closed, so it was a real headache. But thankfully, because of the relationships we had built and the trust that the communities had, um, with the, the research team, we were able to, uh, to do it remotely uh, with our research um, assistants in these countries. And during that time, the Cook Islands and UN governments, they lost premiers and uh, there were climate, uh, negative climate events during uh, 2020, 2021. Now, we can't ever go at anything alone. It is never about the we, it is always about, uh, it's never about the I, it is always about the we. And so in each of the sites we had connectors, and these are people that are recognised in these areas, and the experts, and, and you'll see um, each of them are not only recognised in those islands, but they also have some mana in, in Aotearoa. Um, and it was also important when you talk about mental health to also include addictions, because that is all part and parcel of it. So when we talk about climate change, it makes sense to also have an addiction specialist and, of course, a young person. <clears throat> so the aims of the project, I, I realise that it's late in the afternoon, so I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> I'm not going to keep you for too long. Um, basically, it was just to privilege Pacific voices, because a lot of the, the literature out there is, yes, around adaptation and mitigation, but it's also dominated by a Western discourse that doesn't exactly hit the mark in terms of what it really means to, un to experience climatic events and trauma and uh, negative mental health and well-being um, issues or challenges um, when you don't have Pacific voices at the centre of those challenges. And so it was important to then conceptualise what mental health and well-being and climate change means to the local people 
in the homelands, and then working our way out and seeing what the unmet needs are and practical solutions. So, yeah, t obviously, the ultimate aim is to provide some new information so that they're able to, uh, we are able to form better policy and alignment with some of the needs on the ground. Well, it was a 36-month um, period. It was a slightly longer than that for obvious reasons. And phase one, uh, was there were two phases. Phase one was a Delphi method. It hasn't been done before, so I thought we'd take a risk, and it worked. And so right across the Pacific, we had 70 panellists in the end who were specialists in, in climate change and mental health and wellbeing, or either or. Um, or both, sorry, or both. And then we were able to... Uh, what is it, um, refine the priority areas and with this panel, there were two or three rounds, we were able then to define what were the priorities to Pacific in the sites. And then we had Telenor with each of, with different types of key informants and then focus groups within those sites. Now there were, in a nutshell, in a nutshell these are the themes that we came up with. The, the, there is a definite correlation. Um, no surprises there. We talked about we saw we talked about experiences and the understandings of immobility, um, that traditional knowledges and practices are fundamental when we talk about climate change for Pacific peoples and mental health and mental health and well-being. That there is still that prejudice and discrimination at, towards mental distress, and this is an, an, uh, a Pacific thing, nor a Maori thing. It's a Every, everybody's business type of thing. Um, climate change impacts, you know, um, the help, maladaptive coping skills, so risk-taking behaviours. Um, solastalgia was a concept that was developed by Glenn Albrecht, and we thought, I wonder if it would fly <laughs> with Pacific peoples, even though it's a psycho teratic concept. Of course, they turned it upside down and said, no, 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 because it really did relate to Australian farmers. And we, it's that longing for home when you're away from home. And we tested it with Pacific. And of course, they came up with words that you cannot explain, that are not transliteral, that the English language could not give justice to. So many, many terms. And so it was about collating all this information and giving back to the communities to be able to design, um, capture, and I guess reconfigure what climate change and mental health and wellbeing could do for them and what are the support needs. It was mentioned earlier about the land being an umbil umbilical cord in the same way uh, Pacific see this as a, uh, see this exact um, sentiment. This is likened to, this person talked about being in, in New Zealand and it's easy for someone to shift from flat to flat, right? But for someone in the Pacific, relocation is just a whole new level of, I guess, distress. Um, and also, the, the whole idea about doing this project in New Zealand was that we will need to be prepared, our mental health services will need to be prepared, and Australia, for uh, climate-induced migration. And so this is just the start of it. And so without basically what all the participants participants were saying is that if you lose your land, you, you are nothing. That's how they feel. You, you're nothing because you've lost your papa, you've lost your blood, you've lost your modi, you've lost your umbilical cord. Some of them had, especially in Heta, when I spent some time in New Way, the trauma is so deep. This happened in 2004. The trauma is so deep. We tried to talk about it with the communities. They're not ready. And so it was like, okay, there needs to be a way to be able to talk about this safely with them. Um, how we do that, we have to keep revisiting that and, and keeping that relationship. The devastation is, is still there. <laughs> um, both, they, they saw family members wash out to sea. Uh, the grave sites are completely destroyed. So, you know, it is, climate change is more than just... Um, 
reducing carbon emissions. Indigenous ways of knowing and being. Um, what this one is, is talking about, again, is that, yes, we probably will one day go back to the ways of our ancestors. If anything, we could learn a thing or two, if not more, from our Pacific neighbours, as, as um, like Māori as well, whanaunga. Holistic Indigenous Pacific Approaches. Now, what this one is talking about is they were doing this kind of health initiative in the Cook Islands. And there are 15 islands in total, but there were 12 islands, and they got together. And they considered that, you know, the land is your pito inua. So again, your, your belly button and your centre. And the only way that you could bring those people together was to bring them to your centre, um, metaphorically, but also very deeply spiritually. And that they, they cannot see any, uh, what is it, separation between the land and one's mental health and well-being. I'll let you read through this. So in a coconut shell, I told you I was going to be fairly quick because I saw the programme and I saw I was on at 3.30, so I'm... Um, I'm open to questions. So in a coconut shell, with still a lot of work to do in terms of, um, we don't use stigma anymore in the mental health and addiction space. We use discrimination and prejudice. There's still lots of work to be done in that area. And there's still trauma and mama that is still felt for generations. In Auckland, the devastation is tragic and it's not a very nice place to be. Um, I have been enjoying my time coming in and out of Wellington, in actual fact. Um, the importance of culture, spirit, spirituality, family, community, connections to our ancestors, the environment, resilience, these are all things that need to be highlighted and emphasised. Uh, linkages to livelihoods, workforce, um, the impact of disasters, you know, all these things are exacerbated, the challenges around are exacerbated by climate change. There will be, there is a huge need in the Pacific region, including Australia and New Zealand, to prepare for the, I guess, the outcomes of mental distress, and it will be heightened. We're feeling it in Auckland already. It will increase, so we need to be prepared, is what I'm basically saying. And, and lastly, I wanted to leave with you continuing to listen to the voices of Pacific peoples. You know, it's one thing to have Pacific at the table. It's one thing to have rainbow, rainbow community at the table. Um, our, elder, our older population, our disabled population, um, recent migrants and refugees. But then it's another to listen to those voices. And this is the whole idea of this study, is that it completely flips the script and is culturally nuanced and touches upon issues that haven't necessarily been there because the evidence has been crowded by um, other perspectives. So um, kia ora, and that is me, and I will answer some questions. Thank you. Um, right, we do have a part eye for you, Tuahine. Okay. Um, we know this is having a mental health impact on our Pacific neighbours. What can we do to support the Pacific in relation to their wellbeing needs? Mm, okay, thank you. We know it. <laughs> that's, that's probably a question you'd ask the Prime Minister. Um, <laughs> that's a really tough one. Well, first and foremost, how can we work together? It's not necessarily, it's very easy. And you may be uncomfortable with what I'm about to say now, but it is my truth and our truth. It is very easy to step in with a white savior mentality. The skill and, and the real, the meaningfulness around this is being able to step aside and stand alongside or at least follow behind, because we all know that that's what it's going to take to be able to support um, people in the Pacific. Obviously funding, of course. There are projects around um, 
especially at the University of Auckland, you, you're, you're going to hear some more about them tomorrow. Lots of projects that are out there working with Pacific communities. At the University of Auckland, we have just um, Sir Colin Tukuetonga and his crew there with their Pacific and Global Health Research Centre. Um, they're doing some wonderful work in this space with the mental health survey and in climate change. Also one um, in the Faculty of Arts with MFAT, looking at immobility with Pacific community. So as a university, we're also working with our communities, both here and in the Pacific. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Talo, for many thanks. You have mentioned the importance of spirituality. What is or could be the role of the church in this space? Oh. <laughs> okay, this is probably another question for like an actual minister, reverend. Um, no, um, again, working with the churches and working with leaders. Um, there's a saying in some Pacific communities that we believe that we don't follow ideas, we follow people. So if you work with church leaders, um, <clears throat> then perhaps you're able to work with the congregation. As a church, it's being real about it, it's being open, and I mean, we've seen in Auckland, churches open up their buildings and marae to be able to cater to those who have completely lost their homes. So there are many ways in which the church can help that are not just deeply spiritual, but even practical. <clears throat> What is next on your journey? Will you do more research? Um, oh, that's a lovely question. Um, I hope to do more research. Um, as a pro vice chancellor, you don't necessarily get enough time to do research um, because you're busy looking after, after the university. But absolutely, um, research has been in my blood. Um, inquiry is something that I live for, like you all, um, as nerdy as that sounds. But um, access to information, and when we have the ability and the skill and the privilege and access, I consider that it is my duty of care to be able to share that with other people. That sounds really egotistical, you know what I'm trying to say. Um, to share it with others and, and likewise, you know, I'm always learning and so research as an inquiry is a way of being transformative um, and righting wrongs. Yeah, yeah, sure thing. Do you all have time for a couple more questions? Okay, there's one up there, I've got a couple. Do you want, okay, I'll, ta I'll take these. To um, others have mentioned welcoming our Pacific whānau in the face of climate change in Aotearoa, being somewhat of a modern Hawaii. Can this work? Can this work? Others have mentioned welcoming our Pacific whānau. Oh my gosh. Um, <clears throat> they're really coming out today. <laughs> face of climate. <clears throat> yes, it can work. And I say that because 3,000 years ago, I'm Associate Prof Professor in Pacific Studies, so I'm putting on my Pacific Studies hat here. 3,000 years ago, we tra travelled from Southeast Asia. We could have either gone through Melanesia, so Papua New Guinea, that's the long route. The short route was the other way. So Fiji, 3,000 years ago, Fijians were the first to set foot in Fiji. Oh, well, the wayfarers, seafarers, uh, tupuna. And then from Fiji, they went through to Tonga, Samoa, made its way around Aotearoa, Tahiti, Hawaii. Now that's that version. That's one version. There are many, many versions. There's deep, deep, deep spiritual um, connections to Hawaii. Can it work in the modern world? Absolutely. It has never left. It has always been there. How we reclaim that and how we reignite that is, is, the, is the question, I think, and the focus. Um, there was one more question. Um, oh my gosh, um, slow down. Um, discussing impacts after a major disaster is too late, clearly. Do you think Aotearoa understands the significance of these impacts well enough to prep ahead? <laughs> 
well, it depends on what happens in October, right? Um, <laughs> I think we do. I really do think we do. But for whatever government is in power, whoever it is, there will always be competing priorities. This is definitely one of them because it's something you can't run away with, uh, run away from because it's glo global. Um, but I do consider that all parties are for sustainability. So, yeah, yeah, we can prep ahead if, if our governments uh, support that. The Pacific worldview makes people incredibly vulnerable to mental distress. How do we reconcile that with the need for a renaissance of Pacific ways? Pacific world... Um, okay, so mental health and distress, uh, we heard it this morning from our um, wahine Māori when they were talking about that reclamation and, and almost, um, gosh, I don't, without getting too philosophical, uh, can I say it one more time? <laughs> it's throwing me out, um, sorry, I had, it, I had it and then I've lost it. Oh, okay, it's gone. Is it gone? Yeah. Oh. Indigen I think it's it's about indigeneity. Um, and yes, we could learn a whole lot from it. I think I did mention that. Sorry, I forgot the question. How do we reconcile that with the need of a rest? Oh. <laughs> I'm gonna say one more uncomfortable thing, but it needs to be said. How can you reconcile mental health distress for the Pacific and the need for renaissance of Pacific ways? You eliminate racism. That's it. You eliminate racism because what that does is that disintegrates power. It disintegrates, it elevates equity. But you know, the powers that be, it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily that simple. Um, and this is off the back of the US Supreme Court ruling, so a little bit, a little bit tender around, around this topic at the moment. Um, I think you had a question, and then... Thank you for your comment. Yeah, yeah, that's true. I did want to be, remind everyone, and, and this is probably the time to do that, um, listening to, to your, your um, comment. We are all migrants. We have to acknowledge that we are standing on the land of Tangata Whenua. So everyone else has relocated. I don't think we can ever see any type of climate justice, climate equity, if we don't acknowledge, first and foremost, the matauranga of Māori, the, the status of Māori. Until we do that, everything will click for you. I promise you, everything will click. And yes, we could be world leading in this, because I don't see it in any other country in the world. New Zealand's in a prime position, but we need to take our lead from Māori. So yes, yeah. I mean, when, when Johnny, when you said, you know, with Tokelau and Tuvalu, 
the waters are rising, completely consuming these lands. And when you shared your love, I mean, it's simple, isn't it? It's so simple. Yeah. I, cool. Oh, oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, one more. Kia ora, ngā menu. Kia ora, thank you. Thank you. Ā tēnā koe te marae kura, I always feel inspired in heart and in heart and encouraged um, hearing the solidarity um, that we share with our Pacifica cousins. So kia ora, um, Jemima. Uh, now whānau, we are going to... Um, we're going to move towards our, our panel discussions. And our, this panel discussion is going to follow the theme of restoring the Modi, and it's going to be moderated by Debbie, Dr. Debbie Wilson. Dr. Debbie Wilson, she's Principal Sustainability Advisor, Asset Management and Analysis, Investment and Inf Infrastructure Group at Te Whatu Ora. Debbie is a doubly qualified nurse, RMN, RGN, I'll let her explain the acronyms, and worked in ICU for years before moving into a sustainability manager's role in 2012. Debbie graduated with a doctorate at Auckland University of Technology in 2020. Debbie's research focus was sustainable healthcare practice, carbon measurement, and reduction. Debbie has started working at the Ministry of Health uh, in early 2020, developing guidance around sustainable design for healthcare infrastructure Debbie has also been working in a national role for three years, leading a range of infrastructure-related decarbonisation work streams. Debbie has also been part of Te Whatu Ora Environmental Sustainability and Climate Resilience Group since November 2021. More recently, she's trained as a regenerative practitioner. I didn't know that, Debbie, that's very cool. A regenerative practitioner and is excited about applying this way of being by influencing others to shift away from merely targeting sustainable practice to being much much more holistic and regenerative. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for Debbie. Kia ora, Ken. Tēnā koutou katoa. Ko Snowden te monga, ko Waikato te awa, ko Irish Sea te moana, ko Rererangi te waka, no ingarangi aho. Ke pukekoe aho e noho ana. Ke te mahi aho ki te fatuora. Ko Debbie Wilson toko ingwa. Tenakoto, tenakoto, tenakoto katoa. I'm really super excited to be here. Four till five. That's a really good slot. And I'm um, hoping not too hot because it's actually quite hot in here, isn't it? So if you need to stand up and jiggle around, that'll be fine. Um, so I've got three amazing
panellists are going to, um, they could actually come and join and take, take the seats now if they like. Um, I'm just going to set the scene a wee bit. And um, essentially, uh, my abstract kind of submission was talking about decarbonisation of our health estate because I work in the infrastructure investment group in Tifata Aura, focusing in on um, buildings and, you know, actually buildings can be quite boring, but actually it depends on how you build them. <laughs> um, and there's actually so many multiple benefits that you can get from, from the way that we interact with our um, physical environment. So when, when you got out of bed this morning, I'm sure that um, none of us decided to work in this um, less bad space, which I could argue actually is what's happening if we just focus on being sustainable. It's not t very ambitious. Actually, we need to be much more working on the right-hand side of that continuum and thinking about those much broader reaching environmental impacts and positive social benefits from every single thing that we do not just for me working in infrastructure, but for everybody in their life, in their day-to-day -day lives. So as a regenerative practitioner, we, and I'm a novice, I've got to confess, you know, I did the training about a year ago with, with Dr. Geller, with, with Rob who's in the room, and um, also another colleague, Clinton. And actually, after the training, you know, it's only afterwards that you kind of try and put these kind of learnings into practice. Um, so I kind of like this animation because it, it talks about nested systems and it reminds us that, yes, we are individuals, but we have to connect with others to be successful and to think about how we serve each other, how we serve our communities. So I think it's a really nice reminder. But we also work simultaneously as regenerative practitioners through the lines of sight. Oh, sorry, I'm changing it on my laptop, but not on this. <laughs> Multitasking. Um, so yeah, we, you know, actually, what we do and how we interact with others really has far-reaching effects, and the sky's the limit. So you're going to be, hopefully, um, I'm totally inspired by our panel, panel members, what they're going to talk about. And we're actually going to take you outside, actually, and we're going to talk about how we bring nature indoors. You think about your happy place. Um, you know, actually, my happy place, I've got four beautiful kids, a dog, a mum, and a hubby living at home, and a baby, Pokeko. Um, but that's, that's kind of a real happy place. But actually, being outside is another really happy place. And if all of those um, whanau are with me when we're outside, then that's brilliant. So I, I'm going to just pause on this slide a minute, because when you think about how um, hospitals and Health, health system can be more resilient and efficient. You know, one of the first things you think about is actually let's, you know, generate lots of power on site. Because that's a really good thing to do, right? And actually that can help um, contribute to community well-being because you can actually generate excess power and feed that back into the community that the um, hospitals exist in. But there's, there's more things that, can, that we can actually do. We can actually have green roofs and native vegetation for community and habitat enrichment. And some of these um, pictures, uh, you know, think, gosh, that's not going to happen here, is it? Hospitals looking like that. Um, but why not? Really, why not? We can also collect rainwater. And you are going to hear from um, our, pa our final panel um, presentation that actually there's some really cool things happening in healthcare in, in this exact space. So just kind of cruising through these images, and it kind of makes you, th you know, what brings them to life for me is the fact that you could be in a building, in a hospital, when, you're he when you need to heal, and you're actually connecting with nature, that helps you heal. And it de-stresses you. It gives you that freedom, that space to reflect. And again, open spaces, bright and unrestricted. Of course, I'm focusing in on hospitals because that's where I work. Um, but, you know, it would be kind of cool to think of all of, our, all of our buildings like this. I mean, we're pretty much trapped in a, in a brick kind of big building at the moment. I know there's lots of windows out there, but, you know, actually quite enclosing, isn't it? Um, the way we design our buildings most of the time. You know, the, these places that we build, the places to work, to rest, to socialise, I'd be applying to work in that hospital if that was a hospital near me. How fantastic that would be for, for my mental health well-being and for all the um, users of that building. Let's be playful. Let's be whimsical. 
you know, why are we so boring? Let's, you know, let's get some colour and some vibrancy back into our, our buildings. Gives us a sense of play. This is a real life picture, this next one. Some hospitals um, internationally let you to bring, allow you to bring your pets in. And there's little places for your pets to, to hang out and to, so they can visit you and make you feel better. This is human scale. You know, it's, it's building buildings and thinking about it at a human scale. And this is, again, this is a children's hospital in Boston. And, you know, that sick kids can go up to that little garden and interact with nature. And it's, it's not rocket science, is it? You know, it really does make you feel good. And again, that's the, um, the helicopter view of that children's hospital. So I think that's a nice segue and hopefully a bit of a framing of what we're going to talk about in our panel. We're going to talk about how we interact with nature and how that makes us feel better as, as humans. Um, and I'm now going to hand over to our first panel uh, member, and that's Marg. And I'm going to let each one introduce themselves and they've got five minutes each, or thereabouts, and then we'll go to some questions. Kia ora. Kia ora kato ka, uh, koutou katoa, uh, nā mihi nui ki a koutou. Uh, he kaya ko a hou me te huataki wai ora ki tauranga moana, ko mā Cosgriff toko ingoa. Uh, greetings to everyone here and to those of you who are still out in the hubs and on Zoom. My name is Mā Cosgriff, I'm from uh, Papamoa in the Bay of Plenty and I work in uh, Te Huataki Waiora, the School of Health at the University of Waikato in Tauranga Moana. I also just want to acknowledge from the outset that um, although you can't see them, I've got some academic colleagues alongside me today. I've got Belinda Wheaton, Anna Rolleston, who we get to hear from in the keynote presentation tomorrow, and Lisette Burrows. <clears throat> um, I think through this presentation that Debbie's going to work some magic and my interpretation of providing some slides was to not do what I might normally do in my teaching setting at the university and have lots of words but to bring the beach into this conversation because it's uh, really important and I guess what I'm, these are all photographs that um, I've taken as part of my everyday um, beach wanderings, but is also part of the research that I've been doing with some uh, young people in the, along the coastline of the Bay of Plenty. So if nothing else at this time of the day, I hope that you can just kick back and enjoy the images. They are coming up in random order, so um, I've got no sense of trying to communicate something that's in line with my, um, what I'm actually speaking about uh, today. So our contribution to this um, really exciting panel is that, uh, to talk about some research that we've been um, conducting in regards to healthy coasts and healthy people and what that, that might mean for equitable health outcomes. So the story that we're talking from today is primarily a research one that explores understandings and experiences of coastlines, beaches, in the ocean in Aotearoa. This body of work is grounded in our collective interest in the relations and connections that people and communities have with the places where they live their daily lives and the significance of this for both the health and well-being of people and places and that's clearly been the, uh, a really resounding theme through all the um, presentations today. The various research projects that one or other of us have involvement with and inform our presentation today, have each sought to examine and understand how different people experience and or make meaning of local coastlines in their everyday lives, particularly through informal and formal recreation, sport and leisure activities and practices. These have included a case study, which is the work I'm working on uh, currently with young adults living in the, along the coastline in the Bay of Plenty about the what the beach means in their lives, and Belinda's ongoing work with other colleagues on surfing-focused projects and with uh, new immigrants 
exploring their connections and disconnections to coastal blue spaces through leisure practice. Through these projects, what we've sought to do is work alongside people to learn more about what they do from the shoreline to immersion in water, what draws them or not to the beaches close to where they live, how they are embodied, so bodily experiences in and around the ocean influence different um, people's understandings about the significance of their beach and their lives, and what all of that might mean for well-being. In short, we've been interested in what people say, what they do and with whom and why, and examining things to do with affect, emotion, and symbolic and sensory matters, including touch, sight, sound, feel, smell, and bodily movement. These are the sorts of things I sort of call them the heart things that can be deeply felt and enormously important to people but are not always easy to capture in words. What we've found is that actual, experiential and remembered beach leisure engagement sustained and nourished many people physically, mentally, culturally, socially and spiritually at both an individual and a collective or community level, be it beach walking, fishing, sitting watching waves, surfing, just chilling with mates. Ooh. Beach time offered a chance to switch off from routines, gain perspective for some, an embodied connection to ancestral Māori deities for others, a sense of pleasure from being in the ocean and interacting with more than human entities, and a valued social space for friends and whānau. The conversations here today already and research exploring therapeutic or health promoting landscapes including coastal places testifies that these sorts of findings aren't new. However, we think there's a couple of points um, that might be useful for this discussion about restoring the Māori of the physical environment. Firstly, it was starkly evident in many people's stories about the ways in which coastal leisure engagement enhanced their health and well-being, that the material or physical beach itself matters hugely in this. Quite simply, many of the people we worked with didn't appear to just consider local beaches to be just uh, a backdrop for their own or others' leisure, or just about human health promotion. As one young woman so aptly put it when explaining to me why so many of the photographs that they'd taken as part of the research study featured shells, sand dunes, waves, rock pools and seaweed, the beach is not just us, not just humans. And surfers in Belinda's research echo, echoed similar sentiments. Surfing is the vehicle, is that my time? Surfing is the vehicle but for me it's about connecting to nature it's my way of connecting to the ocean. And I just want to make two more quick points. What seemed to follow for some people from this understanding and appreciation for more than human beach entities was a reciprocity and a care for coastal places. A recognition, if the coast kind of looks after my health and well-being, what do I need to do to look after it? And for us, this raises some really important questions about the opportunities and practices that are needed so that diverse people might similarly get to develop that appreciation of the two-wayedness of human breach relations and of the total interconnection between the mori of the physical environment and our own. And without taking any more time, because I know there might be a chance to come back to this, while there were wonderful stories of connection and holistic wellbeing enhancement, these weren't guaranteed or a given for everyone. It's important to recognise that coastal places and blue spaces more generally continue to be sites of exclusion and risk, reflected in, in, reflected in ongoing um, inequities and impacts of colonisation, and, and how different bodies can access and experience them impacting who can use coastal places and how they can be used. And that we think these stories of disconnect and disenhancement raise equally important questions for us. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you so much.
Marvellous. Right, thank you so much. That's lovely. Get your questions lined up on Slido, please, for Marg. Um, and I'm now going to invite our next presenter, and that's Molly. Do you want to thank do this? Thank you. No, you... Uh, I'll signal to you if I want something okay. changed. Ko put ko puke atua tumanga ko whanganui atara tumoana no Boston, Massachusetts oku tipuna ko white pine forest tangahiri ko lower hut tikainga ko Molly Millish aho. So happy to be here. I need to... Uh, I'm talking about biodiversity as a primary healer of people. Native forest uh, and biodiversity heals people. Uh, and heals people most effectively in the first thousand days. So one of my aims is to get people to put babies and pregnant people into the soil, literally into the soil, during the first thousand days. Uh, we will conclude that uh, early childhood centers in Kohanga Reo should have even the smallest Ngahiri Korowai, as small as 30 square meters can do the job. And by the way, the Tuatara Ngahiri in there, I reckon is about 50 square meters, and it's doing a good job. So be uh, very open-minded as to where you can create biodiversity. Indigenous cultures thrived when they practiced the gift economy of nature. And here is a manual of the gift economy of nature. It's called Braiding Sweetgrass for Young Adults, which is written as a manual. And I put this in the hand of my own Maori uh, people that I'm working with. And they said, we do this. And it turns out that the author of this is probably at a conference in Canada where my colleague John Kingy is now att uh, attending, so he couldn't come here. Uh, colonization took away their resources without permission under the market economy. And this book beautifully contrasts the two economies. We are stuck in a market economy, but the, my friends and colleagues at the Wainui Amata Marae and the Kokiri Marae were pioneers in uh, doing this. So we described the Miyawaki method, which is a little bit described on the poster on the front. Uh, there are two types of forests, a korowai, which you don't touch, but a, ma, a makuru, which creates abundance. And we're working hard at uh, at creating a, a forest of abundance. <clears throat> so uh, we, I call for nurseries, Kohanga Reo, to build, the, that's it. This is a wonderful picture of abundance. That is a 30 square meter forest in Lebanon, only a year old. The next one is a mere 100 square meters in Queensland, uh, created as a refuge for cassowary. And the third is a Pacific Northwest forest on an Indian reservation, which they do use to create abundance of food 
as well as uh, timber. So uh, to build this, the only real cost is a very small ditch digger because you need to create the soil before you get a thriving forest like that. So I do have a paper. If you come up to me, I can give you uh, links to the relevant papers. Uh, so I most particularly hope that Kohanga Reo build very small Ngahiri Korowai and they have alongside a small nursery where people can themselves gather seeds, pot plants, and uh, create the wherewithal at low cost or no cost to build and expand, particularly the Makuru production forests. Rick Lomax asked, uh, as planners and strategists ask, is this the best use of funds? I say that there are ways of using the gift economy, which the Wanui Amata Marae know all about, which will do the job. Thank you. Kia ora, Molly. Some beautiful images here. And it kind of seems kind of intuitive, and you could argue simple, couldn't it? We do overcomplicate things, don't we, as humans? Um, now, I'm going to, um, for some reason, my computer has opened Lotus Notes, so that's strange. Now, I'm going to introduce our final panel member, Ben. Kia ora, Ben. Kia ora tato, co Ben Masters Taka Ingawa. I'm a principal at Becker. I also work with Rick Lomax, who presented before. And my focus is sustainable buildings. Um, I also manage a national team of sustainable building specialists. And over the last, I think, three or four years, I've been working on a number of healthcare projects. Um, this was one of the first ones that I'm going to talk about today, which has actually been completed now. Um, it was gifted a name to Huhi Rapa, and it is a renal dialysis unit up at Taranaki Base Hospital. And um, it's achieved some really cool outcomes already. Uh, it's won a number of awards and everyone loves the building. But what I wanted to focus on was actually how that came to be. It didn't happen by chance and the way we approached that project was fundamentally different right from the outset. So. When I was engaged, um, it was prior to actually beginning design, it was at the briefing stage, and I worked with Ian Grant, who some of you may know, who was the project director, and he, he was the one that actually had the vision, had the, um, had the inspiration to create something different and actually push, push the boundaries. Um, so I, I worked with Ian to create a sustainability brief for the project. This is before we actually started designing, before the architects who were Warren Amani actually started designing. And that was a holistic brief, it wasn't just focused on energy and carbon. It covered a whole raft of things. Primarily it was uh, delivering a, a healthier, uh, better user experience for both patients and staff, as well as addressing environmental sustainability. So that was something quite unique that hadn't happened, uh, to my knowledge, in the delivery of new healthcare buildings. So set, that set the project on a pathway to success early on. So a lot of things were locked in. Uh, we set a raft of uh, targets that covered thermal comfort, indoor air quality, daylight, impacted the uh, orientation of the building, the floor plate depths, um, as well as we overlaid an overall certification target to achieve what's known as net zero energy. So this is one of, I think, the second building in the second or third healthcare building in the world to target this because it is quite hard for a healthcare building, especially this building that has uh, RO plant and dialysis machines that consume a significant level of energy. Around about 40% of the whole building energy is for this uh, medical equipment and plant. So we had to push really hard in terms of the uh, what we could control, which is 
air conditioning, lighting, hot water, those typical building services um, uses. So you can see by these images uh, what we've achieved in terms of primarily daylight, which I'm really proud about, is really unique. There's a shallow floor plan depth, which means you get really good uh, levels of daylight. Um, this shows, you can't quite see it, but there's a sea view that faces north. Um, so someone having lengthy dialysis, dialysis treatment has a view. They can open a window if they want, which doesn't sound that, that new, but it is quite new for healthcare. Previously, healthcare buildings are just air-conditioned boxes. You don't have that access to outside. Um, so that's some good examples of, of focusing on the user experience. Um, so the frameworks, we're also targeting net zero carbon, which we didn't initially target, but the building has a primarily timber structure, which again is different from traditional healthcare buildings that are concrete and steel, which meant we actually met the criteria for zero carbon certification as well. Um, so this is against the international framework. Uh, so everything's measured. We have to uh, reduce the amount of embodied carbon during up until the end of construction. And so the timber, timber structure is, uh, sequesters carbon and that's, that's recognised in the framework as offsetting all of the carbon in the construction. So again, that, that's quite unique for a healthcare building, let alone uh, New Zealand buildings in general. Um, so net zero energy means that over the course of a year, uh, enough power is generated by the uh, PV panels to offset the building's energy on a net zero basis. Excess power in summer goes back to the hospital grid, so we're not actually losing any, or the hospital isn't losing any of that, of that energy that's been generated. But we actually have to prove, we actually have to do that in reality, not just have a design intent. So that means that we're working really hard at the moment to actually achieve those outcomes. So that's um, what we call building tuning. It's actually adjusting the HVAC controls, reflecting changes from when we started designing to when the, the uh, users actually have moved in. And it does have a, a big impact on actually the level of performance. We wouldn't have got that if we weren't targeting this certification. The whole project team has to work really hard to achieve that level of energy efficiency. The other thing uh, we wanted to do is measure the user, the user perceptions of this building compared to a typical building and their previous dialysis uh, department. So we carried out what we call a pre-occupancy survey of the staff uh, while they were in their previous department. It, it's, a, it's a standard survey, an international survey, asks a raft of questions covering things like thermal comfort, daylight, are they too hot, too cold, how do they get to work, ergonomics, that kind of thing. And then we're going to benchmark either towards the end of this year or early next year how successful we were and then compare that to an international database of other buildings. So providing some evidence, some measured evidence of how successful we were, not just environmental performance but also um, user perceptions because it is a healthcare building we, we can achieve uh, better, a better user experience as well as environmental performance. And I think this building actually demonstrates that. It's not either or. Kia ora. Look, this is phenomenal. This is not the normal kind of hospital building you see here, right? But this is a taste of what's to come. This is definitely, like as the Mandalorian says, this is the way. I think that's what he says, isn't it? Thank you. Awesome panel. Um, I'm just going to ask a couple of questions. Um, I'm going to direct the first question to Mar Mark, and then I'm actually going to come to the Slido questions as well. Can I ask you, Mark? Why is examining everyday relationships between people and coastal places so important. Would you like to come up and answer that, please? Uh, there's probably lots of ways I could answer that, but um, I think what's really important is that it gives uh, a chance to explore different people's stories and it brings it to the local and it can bring it to the everyday. And um, 
I guess as someone who has the privilege of uh, being engaged in research, it also uh, challenges me in terms of some of the assumptions I might bring into those conversations and some of the ways that um, making sure that someone, I think, was it Jemima said it, um, making sure that stories are actually heard, and which I think is the, an obligation of a researcher. So I think that um, people and places coming into conversations is, is really, really important in, in terms of understanding how people connect and or disconnect and, and what that means in their everyday lives. And I think the other thing I'd just sort of emphasise is that when you bring place into the conversation, it changes the research conversation when place is the active participant in research as well. Stay there. No. <laughs> I've, got I'm a, going. I've got a question for you that's come through here. Did you come across any thoughts of grief, anxiety in the context of likely impacts of climate change on the beaches with erosion, for example? Yes. Yeah, look, just even with the, some of the young people I spoke to, um, and, and these are, are these be young people who might go to the beach once a month when um, it drew them, or it might, there were some who were very wrapped up in like surf life saving along the coastline, so um, very different experiences, but um, almost resoundingly, um, the things that came up that really bothered people around, you know, talk about climate change and all that stuff, was, was the everyday uh, rubbish and waste and also some of the stuff that's going on with coastal erosion. And it really um, bothered people about how we were or were not um, sort of activating around that and whose responsibility it was exactly. or not. Kiora, thank you. You're free to go for a moment. Okay, Molly. I'm really interested in finding out a little bit more of those potential benefits um, because of the diverse microbiome in the forests and the, you know, is this a key and very effective um, public health intervention, what you're proposing? Indeed. It has only been quite recently researched that the microbiome, which is all of the bacteria that live in our gut and, and viruses and other things live in our gut, our oral cavities, our lungs, these uh, get trained in the first thousand days of life. If you have good close association with microbes and other, you know, not just bacteria, you will resist autoimmune diseases for the rest of your life. Quite recently researched, has been confirmed time and time again, and is to me a reason that early childhood must get in contact with real soil and real forest. Absolutely. Thank you. And and thinking about how um, you've worked with, with Māori and mana whenua. Yes. How, how has this been embraced, the idea of city forests um, in or, or near their marae? Have you had much experience? Yes. Uh, people I work with on the Wainui and Mata marae are dead keen to do it, absolutely keen to do it. But they, the land itself is co-managed by Hutt City Council, Te Atiawa Iwi, and Wanui Amata, which is an urban marae, which serves all the low-income people, Pacific, uh, Indian, you know, all races. And the ability to do exactly what Wanui Amata want to do on that piece of land has not yet been finalized. Difficult? but they know how important it is. Kia ora. Kia ora. Thank you. I, I've, got, I've had a question um, actually as well. Um, have I come across the concept of biophilic public health? Biophilia, but bi biophilic public health. Whoever asked that question, come and see me afterwards, please. A lot of synergies with regenerative practice. Um, 
Okie doke, I'm going to ask Ben a question next. What are the, some of the key lessons learned, Ben, that you can share? Yes, I've been um, thinking about um, what, what, what was successful on this project, what were the kind of key interventions. I think it's what I mentioned before, is actually spending the time coming up with a, a solid brief um, and actually articulating that in a way that a project team knows what they need to achieve, what the target outcomes are, and it does take a bit of time to actually consider that. And doing that before you lock in a budget for a project as well, sustainability, it has to be early on, it's not an add-on, it's holistic in the overall uh, design for a building. Otherwise it can be challenging to make things stack up, it always gets measured by financial performance, payback periods, but we've kind of moved beyond that. That's, that's what we do, but we need to define it in the right way. Stay there, there's a lot of questions. How did you manage to convince the facilities teams that green building was the way to go? And, and how do we roll it out across? So this was, yeah, so this is what's fundamentally changed. We don't have to do the convincing as much now, but we did have to spend a lot of time trying to quantify the benefits. And there were a number of tangible benefits, so energy savings. So to date, since the, since the building's uh, been completed, the solar panels themselves have um, offset about $6,000 worth of power. So that's an obvious OPEX mm -hmm. benefit. Um, we've got rainwater harvesting, so that's saving water. Uh, purchasing water. Yeah. Um, and then there are all the, 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 harder, the, the other benefits, harder to quantify, but that health and well-being, attracting staff, we had to really kind of be transparent about what, what are you going to achieve. Um, but it was a challenge and there were a lot of naysayers and Ian Grant was, he was the kind of driving force behind that, mm. as was Debbie. Oh, yep. <laughs> you. <laughs> there was a lot of, and a lot of sustainability managers yeah. in the audience here today. There was a lot of, you know, movement. A lot of drive, yep. a lot of momentum. Yep. And now the snowball is so big that it's just rolling down that hill. That's great. Kia ora. I might get you up in a minute. Again, I hope this is working this way, no bit of, you know, to and froing. Um, I have got another one for you, Mark. Do you think that your findings would be applicable to casual recreational use of other natural, natural areas too? Rivers, hills, forests, mm. reserves? Absolutely. So, I mean, the sort of um, research spaces that we've been um, conversing with through our work is, you know, much of the stuff that many of you will be familiar with in terms of green space and blue space. So. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of research around the value in terms of for human well-being, and that's what a lot of the research has, um, I guess, uh, certainly initially tended to focus on without making the connection to the two-wayedness, so, um, which is obviously really, really important. But yeah, there's, there's lots of um, similar sorts of findings both here and internationally, which can um, be really useful for arguing the case when, if you need to make the case in terms of gains for human mm -hmm. health and well-being from uh, really informal, might be really periodic, um, I go when I need to sort of stuff, but people understand that and the young people I spoke to definitely un understood what it was, yeah, for them. I've got another question for you. Did you come across inequitable access to the coastline and how can we help mitigate that? That's a good question. Uh, yes. Every, every, time, um, every time someone says that, they don't, that their body doesn't fit on, in a beach space or the coastline because of some of the narratives around uh, what coastlines are for and who should use them and how they should be used, then that, that's probably pointing to um, inequities. I mean, that's, that's, the sort of, that's the big question, isn't it? I think um, the points that have been, that have come really uh, so strongly through from other people in our keynote is today, um, is that some of the understandings and uh, narratives around outdoor spaces that are continue to be arguably grounded in quite Western discourses need to be really challenged. 
because because they are exclusionary. They're exclusionary for all sorts of people, and um, access even at a really a, a practical, applied way. When when young woman talked about not having a body that's considered a beach body, then we've got an access issue. When someone says I'm the only surfer who looks like this on a wave, or you know, so those are access issues, and and that's without without even thinking about mobility and and all those other things. So. Um, how we understand spaces, I think, which is probably the, the link we were talking you know, about practice and theories and ideas, and yet, yeah, they are married together. So that brings me to one more question before you sit down. Yeah. What are some implications of policy and research that arise from these projects and these bodies okay. of research? I'll, I'm just going to say one for research. Um, <clears throat> uh, is that who we talk to and how we talk with, not with rather than to, really um, influences, and I mean, this is obviously self-evident, but it influences what, what we find, doesn't it? So who we research with and alongside um, teams of people, etc., etc., and whose stories kind of get brought forth through that um, really influence things. And I think that one of the things that I can personally talk about in relation to my own research is that I've um, embraced, I've been around for a very long time, but approaches that have um, tried to allow for the, um, the visual and the sensory and the embodied to be in the conversation. And that for me has been um, with photographs and young people uh, bringing photographs into their conversations that they can talk about you know, what this means for them in relation to photographs. And what that has also enabled is that some of them more than human to be in conversations and it's far kind of otherwise quite interesting conversations to initiate with people about what sand means and waves and water and all that. But So as a research I guess it's thinking about how do you work alongside people. And I have no answers. Kia ora. Thank you. Molly, this is a good question for you. What would be the first things that we should plant to start off our forests, if we want to all start to off start our forests? To start planting our forests. What, how do we go about that? Give us some practical advice. Practical advice. You'll find many native forest restoration, particularly our forests and bird, doing a lot of potting. You can work with as a volunteer in these potting groups and learn to do it yourself. It's not very hard. And basically, uh, although if you buy the plants, they cost between three and $10 each, you can learn to do it yourself and do it as a group. Awesome. That's really Simple. good. Yep. Quick and easy. Um, before you, you sit, um, uh, I've got a question here. Are tiny forests safe? Ah, when I first described tiny forests at a civic trust meeting in Wellington, somebody urgently said, bad people will hide in that forest and jump out at children. Now, if you look at the poster that I uh, place on the main table, you'll see that the Dutch tiny forests are surrounded by poles. Those poles could be grown in a Makuru forest for nothing, and they would prevent bad people from jumping out. And they would come for free, and the rangatahi would learn to work with wood, and they would physically work in this biodiverse envi environment. Good for everybody and everything. I'm in. I'm sold, Molly. Absolutely brilliant. Ben, it's your turn. Okay. If you can just... Um, sorry, Ben. Sorry, ben. Molly. <laughs> okay, can you just elaborate a wee bit on, uh, on the heat and ventilation and cooling system settings, HVAC setting? And is it changed depending on occupancy of the unit? turned off at night and are you using many controls? Uh, we're doing as much as we can to be honest. Um, so in this building there's, um, there's treatment bays and then there's 
office admin areas, then there's consulting rooms. We've got uh, a bit what's called a BMS, controlling the HVAC system, um, building management system. Within that, there's a lot of complexity in terms of um, schedules, temperature, temperature settings, what's called demand ventilation control, heat recovery ventilation. Um, I won't go more techy than that, but there's kind of best practice, yeah. So that's what we're spending time at the moment, tuning that. The kind of operating times have changed. There's a different, there's a, a double shift of dialysis. So we're mm. kind of adjusting as we go. And it's not every day. It's switched off on Sundays. And then there's dialysis machines as well. There's a whole lot going on that we're mm. doing as much as we can to minimise the energy. Yep. So is it 24-7? Is it open seven days a week? And no, it's an outpatient. Yes, yeah, so it's six, six days a week, closed Sundays. But they do have um, self-care that someone can come and carry out their own treatment. Yeah. Yep. And what right rating is it from an earthquake prone point of view? Uh, I think it's IL2, IL2. pretty sure. Yeah. Yep. And tell us a wee bit about your water conservation activities. I'm really interested in hearing that. So we, we did spend a, time, a bit of time looking at can we do something with the RO water itself. By far, that it just consumes a heap of RO. RO. Can you Re reverse os <laughs> osmosis water that is used for the dialysis treatment. Um, consumes a heap of potable water. Um, next project, I'd spend more time to try to figure it out, but we got told that it's in the two hard baskets. So what we've done to kind of counteract that is we do have rainwater harvesting. So we're capturing rainwater from the roof and we're using that to flush the toilets. Um, and then we do, on the stormwater side, all of the stormwater is captured on site. There's rain gardens. Um, and you can't quite see it in the images, but there's a, there was a, there's quite a bit of effort going into planting of natives as well, and that's grown pretty fast. It's not a forest, but <laughs> it's getting there. Um, so all of the landscaping, there's quite a bit of effort going to that as well. Yep. Crazy. Oh. It's crazy good. Very important. Yes. Would you, would you please take, come up, please. And Robin um, is just going to come over here, works closely um, with Molly. If you just maybe introduce yourself. Kia ora, I'm Robin. Um, as Debbie said, working with Molly. There were just a couple of points that I think came out in all the, the presentations, one of which is the inequity of access. And Molly emphasised that having these tiny urban forests at um, early childhood education centres, uh, Kohanga Reo. Um, I looked at the tree cover assessment for Tamaki Makara, Auckland, where I used to live. And in many of the South Auckland suburbs, it's less than half of the recommended tree cover and less than half of what it is in the wealthier suburbs. So I think it's particularly important that these be um, promoted, funded, supported in, in those areas first. And the other, uh, in the course of sort of researching about this, there were some staggering statistics uh, on the amount of money that was spent on things like uh, IBS, irritable bowel syndrome in Europe. And it was actually trillions of dollars in North America and Europe. And just thinking of the opportunity to prevent some of these illnesses, you know, with the allergies and atopic things, by something as simple as enabling children to play in tiny forests or even uh, sand pits which are enriched with soil from them. I mean, to me, it's just the most cost-effective public health intervention out there. Thank can you, you. Can you just explain what you do and your background and where you're coming from? <laughs> uh, well, I'm a retired medical doctor, but I was always particularly interested in preventative health care. And my day job now is as a climate activist with Nelson Tasman Climate Forum and, and our climate declaration. Kia ora. Thank you. Kia ora. Awesome. I see I've got a question here. Are any more big build new hospitals planned that are going net zero. So in our design guidance um, for Tifata Order, 
what we've what we're encouraging what we're stating is actually builds and capital builds under 50 million um, should go for net zero certification and um, net zero energy certification um, so yes there will be um, what depends on what you define as big <laughs> um, 10 to 50 million it's fairly big anything over 50 our guidance states that you need to be um, green star 5 certified um, but all, all projects need to undertake life cycle analysis um, to measure and target lowering their embodied and operational carbon, um, being much more energy efficient, water con conservation um, targets, waste minimization targets, plus they need to do energy modeling. Um, so there's been a lot of progress made in the um, healthcare infrastructure space, which is awesome. Now, I'm going to ask if, can I get my slides back up because there was a... Um, kind of poignant closing slide. I want to have a picture. It's actually one of your pictures I stole. <laughs> so it's, it's 4.52. It's um, coming to the end of the first day. So if everybody is, um, is OK with me to just kind of finish now, um, then that's good. I'm actually feeling very hot still. I think we need to get the temperature right tomorrow, so we're all going to be cooking. But don't forget that we're all here tomorrow. For any questions that weren't asked, go directly to our lovely colleagues here, and let's continue this um, Cordero. And I mean, look at that lovely image to finish off. And I just wanted to say that it actually takes courage to try something new, but the benefits can be incredible. We're all becoming increasingly aware of the importance of protecting and replenishing our diminishing resources. It will only be a matter of time before the limitations of any current mindsets or legislation will give way to the critical mass of people who want change. So change by adopting system thinking, more regenerative approaches will help connect people to each other, to this place and to all life. Kia ora. The time has come um, to put a close to the day. And, um, and I just want to address the question, um, like, how did I end up and how did I end up with the job of MC? I'm the quietest on the organising committee. And um, I should have said from the start, it's because my postdoctoral work is based around indigenous values and ecological health and wellbeing. So today really spun my wheels. Um, everyone's caught it all. We're amazing. Um, it feeds the enthusiasm, that the growing enthusiasm and awareness of the mahi ahead of us. And um, we're all aware that we have huge obstacles. We have massive vested interests in the business as usual community, but, um, and we agree on that, but, I mean, one of the things, if I draw a circle around what we discussed today, is that there is a, a willingness to work together and that there is a remembering of our tikanga and our kawa and, and, and our environmental practices as indigenous people and as alongside with our allies and our Pacific cousins um, to, to go the distance um, because that's how we see the world and it's how we understand it. Um, I've got to say, the little cue box on the run sheet says, MC reflects on the day and like in about 50 point font in bold and italicized it says enthusiastic <laughs> with a big exclamation mark and I'm like what's the, is, do I, am I meant to talk about the day being in the, <laughs> I should be enthusiastic so I hope I covered that brief um, now um, touching on Apopo because obviously we're carrying on tomorrow so we're kicking off at 8.30 and um, we have some more highlights for you. We'll, tomorrow we'll have the Ministers of Health and Climate Change along with more panels and speakers, and I'll be here. And, um, you know, it's going to be another fantastic day of coming together and, and sharing. And um, one more thing I wanted to touch on, you know, we, Māori, we have, our, we have our own concepts and ways of how we think about climate and the changing climate and how our relationships to our atua and to our places of belonging that make us well. But we also have, you know, our understandings around coming together and 
you know, we have a lot of strong metaphors, whether we use the one of the waka, he waka e kenoa, we're in this boat together, or naku te rauro, nau te rauro, ko ora ai te iwi. You know, with my food basket, your food basket, the people will be sustained. But we, um, we agree, we're in this together. So, um, la, second to lastly, please remember to do the Slido survey. And on a final note, for those of you who have prepaid for the dinner at Monsoon Poon, we will be meeting at 6.30. No data. A hirungi tēnā māku e whakakapi u tō tātou hui huinga mō tēnei rā. On that note, I will close us today with a karakia. And um, so it's just a, we can carry on. Uh, no data. A e tau nei ki rungi a tātou kato te wairua o ngā mātua tūpuna. Nā rātau i whakataka tō te ara hei hiko i ngā mātātou ngā uri i whakatoki o tātou ngā kau ki ngā tika, tika ngā hei aratakia tātou ngā. Nui ia ma, mahi tātou katoa i roto i te pono i te teke me te aroha ono o te te hiki te te e rongo whakihiri aki ki rongo tuturo whiti whakamau kia tīna, tīna, hui e tāike. Kia ora whanau.